coverage of the inaugural edition of the podium esports daytona 500 live today from daytona international speedway in daytona beach florida 
A very special welcome to you all from up here in the broadcast booth. I am James Pike, the voice of Podium Esports, and we have a whole host of colleagues alongside me today. Our producer, Cisco Scaramuza, and up in the booth with me are James Grahula, David Schildehouse, and John Theodore to bring you all the action here from the World Center of Racing as we find out who will come away with the biggest share, $7,500 purse and a sim rig courtesy of GT Omega Racing. I turn first to you, David Schildhouse, as the standard number two in command here. And David, we came through a whole bunch of action this weekend. We had qualifiers on Friday night. We had all kinds of qualifying racing yesterday to trim our registered field of 171 drivers down to 43 to start today's Great American Race. And what did you learn over the weekend that you think will apply here? What can we expect to see here for 200 mile or 200 laps and 500 miles of action on the high banks of Daytona? Thanks, James. Good evening and good afternoon, race fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining us and tuning in to the greatest spectacle in sim racing today. And James, what we saw yesterday through seven qualifiers, two Lance Chance qualifiers and two duels was the favorable line being the inside right next to that yellow line. A lot of people said it was truly their best teammate, the biggest ally that they had on the high banks here at Daytona because you can't pass to the left of it. And just it took so much organization to try and make that outside line work. We didn't see very many drivers use it to their advantage. Only a few were really able to do it. Guys like Malik Ray, Steve Sheehan were able to shoot up there, get a big push, and then drop back down to the bottom side. So I'm anticipating a lot of drivers favoring that inside lane. I think some drivers built a big log of notes as well throughout all the activity yesterday to be able to formulate a plan to attack that inside lane, organize within themselves, get up to the high side, and make it a viable lane to work with as well. You bring up valid points, David, but James Carhula, there are two things that I think of here that I might throw up just to sort of test those theories a little bit. The first is that I think as we saw the racing progress and we got to the dual races last night presented by JDR Graphics, we saw the high line come into its own and as the quality of drivers stepped up and went higher up and higher up, we gained SOF with each race. So did the ability of the drivers on the outside to run. And I also wonder if the track conditions might have played into it a bit as well, because in the nighttime, it seemed like the high lane worked a little bit better than it did early on in the day. The nighttime is the right time. Uh, there's multiple things that factor into that. When we are going through the qualifying races, only 30 laps, not really a whole lot of time for your tires to really come into effect there uh, to where you really need to be searching around the track to find more grip. Uh, but as we get later into the evening, the temperatures on the track start coming down. And especially when we get to nightfall and also with a bunch of drivers that know what they are doing, when you know that you can trust that person there on the inside line, you can really take full advantage of that side draft and get really down close uh, to the corner panel of the driver on the inside through the corners. All of that is a recipe to be able to get that outside lane working and really only the best of the best are able to get it going. And I mean, that's exactly who we see here in our field here today. Now, John Theodore, I'll turn to you next. You drove in the qualifying races yesterday, and uh, I think you'll probably have the best take of anyone as to how the draft works here with this package, and especially at this time of day. What should we expect from the drivers behind the wheel? I know it's tough to see. It's tough to get a handle on things when you're traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour, but did you pick up anything that you'll be looking for out of this field when we take the green flag in just a little bit? Uh, certainly. I mean, it, as you guys already mentioned, definitely the uh, bottom line uh, was dominant. It's really hard to get anything going on the top side. So track position is going to be extremely important. Drivers, are, you know, obviously we've got a big prize that we're going to be going at. So every driver in this field, you know, the, the, the prize yesterday was making the field. The prize today is winning the thing. And uh, track position is going to be extremely important. So I think you're going to see as the race progresses, increased desperation. Uh, a couple things that I noticed from the driver's seat, uh, one that I had to fend off yesterday, and then um, uh, just what I noticed from watching other things is that um, the you might we might see the bump and run in play at Daytona, which sounds a little crazy, but one of the ways that I was noticing guys were able to make passes if they were willing to do it was to root and gouge on the bottom. If you get your bumper into someone in the corners it's obviously a risky move but you can if you can get them a car width up and then get your nose in there that's one way that you can root a guy out from the bottom 
and make a pass. And when you've got the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500 victory on the line, I think you're going to see several guys in this field who are willing to make that move. One of the biggest prizes in sim racing on offer here at the Daytona 500 outside of the main event itself. But we'll bring in some of the drivers here who will be competing in the race a little bit later. And we'll start off first with the driver of the Peak Appliance Ford Fusion, the number three machine who will roll off from 13th on the grid. Uh, also a Podium Esports Elite Series Gold Division regular. That'll be Nick Morse. And Nick, welcome up to the broadcast booth here as we get set for action at Daytona. Just how excited are you to be a part of an event that is so big and so massive within the iRacing community? I'm extremely excited. You know, when this was announced, I thought this is definitely a race that I want to do. And uh, when I saw all the incredible drivers who... Uh, we're going to compete for this. I thought, you know, it's going to be really hard to make it. So the fact that we were able to qualify and transfer through with so many really, really good drivers, um, including peak drivers who missed the field, um, it's, I'm just ecstatic. So really excited for it. I'm happy to compete for some money today and hope to make my sponsor, Peak Appliance, and everyone at Podium Esports proud. And you had a pretty good go of it in the duels yesterday and managed to get yourself into this race with the top 10 finish. What did you learn over the course of the day that you're going to try and apply to the race here in a little bit? Uh, the thing that I learned the most was that um, it takes some help to get the outside line going. And uh, inside is, you know, definitely the safer place to be. But at the same time, it's kind of a catch 22 um, because, um, uh, you know, if the outside line gets going, you get boxed in. And with how smooth the track is here, um, you're kind of stuck down there. So I learned a lot yesterday and um, was able to get two good finishes out of it. And um, I'm really excited to see how it goes today. Although today's strategy will probably be a lot different than what we had to employ yesterday. And as always, before we let you go, take a moment here to thank everyone who's gotten you this far and all the people who will be supporting you today in the Podium Esports Daytona 500. Well, I want to thank Podium for putting this on. I want to thank Peak Appliance uh, for sponsoring my number 12 or number three today, excuse me, Ford Fusion. Um, I want to thank HPM supporting me. And I want to thank uh, Mason Weitzel, Garrett Robinson, Daniel Fockingham, a lot of the other guys who worked with us and Raul Alves for making it. And I'm really excited to do this today. So thanks for putting this on mainly to you guys. And thanks to HPM and Peak Appliance for the support. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your pre-race to talk to us, Nick. And we'll see you out on track in just a little bit. Best of luck to you. Thanks, guys. There's Nick Morse, who managed to come through the dual races and get a spot in the Daytona 500. And from Nick, we turn to the top two qualifiers in the entire field. Two men who got to skip out on yesterday by virtue of setting the fastest times in fixed qualifying. And that would be the pair from Junior Motorsports, newly minted here in advance of the 2019 peak season. Michael Conti, our pole sitter, and our outside pole sitter, Nick Ottinger, starting second on the grid. Michael and Nick, and congratulations to both of you and welcome up here to the booth. Thanks for having us. Yeah, also, appreciate, yes. you, appreciate let, you having us here, putting this event on, man. Let, let me make sure I get this straight and get my numbers right, because I totally blank for a moment. Uh, Nick, the JTT Doherty Racing driver, apologies. So we'll we'll get that straightened out at some point here. But uh, I'll I'll cede to you then and give you a chance to uh, get here on the board first with the interview, just because I totally botched that there. But Nick. Uh, your thoughts here, You, I would assume, watched a good chunk of the racing last night. What do you think you're going to see once you get out on track? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going to be a little, a little patience on everyone's part, hopefully. First, like, uh, I'd say 100 laps of this race, and then people's probably going to start trying to get a little antsy and position themselves a little bit better. Um, and I mean, Mikey, we've worked with each other for a while, especially at these plate tracks, too, and um we've always tried working working with each other so i assume we'll be able to get in single fire on just hopefully ride for a bit and michael i'll turn to you sort of the same thing your take on everything from what you saw yesterday on the stream of the qualifying day racing for the daytona 500 here from podium esports yeah i definitely think um, you're going to see a lot of guys that didn't qualify too well the guys in the back they're they're going to going to try to make something happen here in the first few laps and everybody's bunched up on the bottom and checking up it just seems like once everybody's up to speed and the bottom line is formed it's pretty tough to make that outside work unless you have a ton of help up there so you know the back is definitely going to be really racy i think the guys in the front if we're smart which i hope we are hopefully we'll get single filed out and uh, bide our time and just hold position but 
it's going to be an awesome race. There's a lot on the line with the uh, the purse for this race. It's huge. There's a lot of prestige around this and a lot of hype. So uh, hopefully that doesn't get the best of everybody. Hopefully the anticipation is uh, you know not too much for for the guys in the race today. Hopefully we can uh, keep it clean at the beginning and uh, have something to race with at the end. Now, I'll go back to Nick here. The one question that applies to both of you that doesn't apply to anyone else in this field, since you don't have track time with the rest of this group here uh, and from qualifying day yesterday at the Daytona 500, are there any sort of nerves just with the lack of experience with the drivers around you, or is it one of those cases where you can lean on the mountains of experience that you have here, especially with this package at Daytona, that sort of makes you comfortable and makes you say, you know what? It doesn't really matter. I don't need the day. I'm ready to go, and I've got a fast car and ready to try and send my best shot out to win this race. I think you mentioned it. Mentioned it, man. We've we've been coming to this Daytona track for I've been coming to it at least seven years. Peak series. So I mean, we got a lot of experience here, and um, I mean, new drivers. I don't really mean much. I mean, all you have to really do is just. Make sure you hold a pretty line, and I, I suspect a lot of these guys are going to be able to do that. It's not really that difficult at, at a track like this. So, I mean, it's just going to be – it could be a learning experience for sure, but it would be good. I mean, it's starting up front. Ain't really got too much uh, to look at in front. If, if I get down behind Mike, I'll just be staring at his bumper the whole time. And Michael, uh, to be the pole sitter here for the inaugural podium esports states on a 500, it isn't necessarily quite peak action, but imagine that's got to mean a lot to you here and a nice little accomplishment to add to an already pretty impressive resume. That's uh, definitely awesome to get the pole for this race. Uh, you know, Nick and I qual- qualified uh, one, two, obviously, but we signed up really late, didn't really have any intentions of running this thing until about Thursday night or so. Uh, saw everything that was going on with the, uh, hype around the event the purse like i'd mentioned before and figured we'd give it a shot but i don't think either of us expected to uh qualify nearly that well and and then be able to skip out on the uh, qualifiers yesterday which was uh you know a good position to be in but you know as you said i've been sim racing for years now and you know, with the peak championship and uh runner up third place i mean i feel like i've accomplished quite a bit but there's something about this event that's special i don't know if it's just the amount of people that signed up for it or the amount of work that obviously went into making it what it is. But this is a pretty cool one-off event. Uh, my hat's off to Podium and everybody that's made this happen. This is uh, this is pretty big. So uh, the poll is awesome, but finishing well and maybe even getting a win would be uh, even cooler for us. First to me, or first to you, Nick. Very quickly, a chance to send your thank yous, your shout outs to everybody that make it or makes it happen for you out here today at Daytona. Uh, Mikey touched on it. Thank you guys for sure for putting this prestigious event on. Um, I know it's a lot of organization for you guys to put this together in such, I'd say, a couple a couple of days and have a lot of good good posit- positivity around it. And I just decided to represent my new team this year, JTD Darty Racing. And I mean, all the partners, Kroger and them. I mean, I, I, it's a great opportunity to represent a real NASCAR team. Um, it's a great step for our peak series, and hopefully we can start them off right with at least running good tonight um, and maybe pull off a win. And Michael, to you, who makes it happen for you? I just have to thank everybody at Junior Motorsports for uh, believing me, uh, believing in me and and picking me in the draft. Uh, Brad Davies, especially, he had a huge hand in in making that happen. So uh, Dale, Junior Motorsports, Brad, everybody there, thank you so much for having me drive this car. Uh, We've got some sponsors on it, Mac Tools, Bosch, and Racing Electronics. Uh, They're supporters of jrm so hopefully we can uh get them a good finish today and uh, i'm excited i'm excited for the race and excited for um everything that's to come this year we're gonna have a lot of cool stuff going on on our twitter handle at mike conti five so definitely uh, give that a follow if you're not already hopefully some giveaways uh some streaming to come this year so there's gonna be a lot of action on the handle this year so excited for that and uh, excited to see how this thing shakes out today it's gonna be an awesome race and i hope that everybody that's watching it has a good good time uh, watching us go around here. Well, thank you both for the time, and best of luck to both of you, and we'll see you out there on track in just a moment. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. So, 
There are your front row for the Daytona 500. And now we bring in two drivers who teamed up very well in the second duel race to come home with the victory and the runner-up spot in the duels. And they will be starting fourth and sixth on the grid. They're Peterson Irrigation, Chevy Camaros for Vincere Racing, Christian Peterson and Seth DeMerchant here. And hello to both of you in the berth. First, I'll turn to you, Merch. You managed to get the victory there, but how fun was it to be able to work with CP through all the madness of the duel race presented by JDR Graphics last night? It was a lot of fun, and it was a uh, good practice for uh, what we're going to do today, and hopefully we can uh, execute it just as well. And CP, yeah, you were the one who was sort of a little bit mired back in traffic, and you had to sort of fight your way up to get to Merch. So uh, did you learn anything in racing all the qualifying races yesterday that you're going to try and apply to the action here today? Oh, yeah, definitely. There's a few things. Um, obviously, I don't think everybody's going to be able to just stay on the bottom like they did in the duels races. Um I was able to get up there on the top and just cruise by people pretty much from my lonesome for a little bit while they were checking up and then we got a top line going so uh it was just good seat time and um and good to get to know all the guys that were racing against up there and and hopefully we can do the same today and south here to be able to win the duel to get that sort of knocked down out of the way you've got one win here how much does that build confidence for the race that's about to take place uh, well, also won the qualifier, so uh, I'm I'm feeling pretty good about the uh, race today. Uh, I think we have a really good shot. Uh, just all comes down to where we're positioned late in the race. Uh, see what we can do. And CP, you got a plenty of experience here. We know you more as a short track driver, but to to get a win here at Daytona, what would it mean to you to be able to knock out the Daytona 500 and add that to your accomplishments? Man, being a part of this whole ordeal with uh with podium is pretty cool. <laughs> the uh hold on, I gotta mute. The uh it's just uh, I mean, I don't do a lot of these A car races and uh show up on Thursdays every now and again, but um we'll see what we can do and hopefully call it another one and done. Very quickly, Seth, just take a moment to thank everybody, I'd say for both of you, since you both have the same partners for the most part. Yeah, just Peterson Irrigation for being in the car. And again, like last night, uh, you guys for putting on this event. This has been really cool. Probably uh, one of the coolest events I've ever been in in the game. And uh, hopefully we have a good race. And CP, I, I know you got a few more people supporting you here today. So take a moment to send your shout out your thank yous to those that you need to go ahead and touch on before we go green. Yeah, just everybody at uh, everybody at Vincere Racing and, and Peterson Irrigation for getting all these cars uh, into the show. It it uh it really shows uh, what teamwork can do up here in in a restrictor plate race and um, I just want to take a quick moment to uh, say uh, one of my one of my good friends passed away a couple of days ago and um, we're all we're all sporting a little memorial sticker on our car there so um, hopefully y'all will catch that on the broadcast um, at some point they're all on the front bumper so. So you got people watching down from a little bit higher up the top of Daytona International Speedway for you. Always a special moment. We'll see uh, if they can sort of power you to victory here today. I know that would mean a lot to you and everybody at Vincere. So thank you, Seth. Thank you, Christian. Best of luck to both of you, and we will see you here in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. So Christian Peterson, Seth the Merchant. Two drivers who you know will find their way next to each other, get the chance to work with each other. And I think, John, I want to turn to you on this because you saw it firsthand, the importance of having teammates and drafting partners here at Daytona. It's something that we talk about all the time, but it is something that just cannot go understated. It is so, so incredibly important. It really is. You, you know, the, the, this is one of the places where you really need um... – you, you need to have teammates out there. You, the, the, you know, Darrell Walter talks about it a lot of the time, the uh, co-opetition that goes on out there. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, uh, everyone's going to try, everyone's going to want to get the win for themselves. But you need to have teammates and people that you trust to work with to do it. And, and so part of it is having the guy that you trust, you know, and, and coordinating like, okay, we're going to jump to that high line and try to make it work. Having two or three guys to go up with you. That's part of it. The second piece is having the trust in your competitors that the guy behind you isn't going to do something silly or root, uh, root you out of the way um, 
like I was talking about before, you know, so it's, you know, everyone's got guys out there on the track, their teammates, and then they've got that larger group of guys that they trust. And then they've got the guys that, you know, maybe they don't trust or don't have the comfort level racing around. And that's what makes racing interesting is watching all of that imperfection collide with each other. As you see on your screens here, that aforementioned Memorial decal that Christian Peterson talked out that you'll see on the Vincere Racing cars, both his car and Seth DeMerchant's here a little bit later. So uh, a fallen friend, a close friend. I know CP has got a lot of really tight relationships, and everybody at Vincere certainly thinking of Ty Steezy as we get set to take the green flag here for the Podium Esports Daytona 500. We'll take a quick break, and on the other side of it, we will return with the starting grid and the beginning of the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. You're watching coverage here live from Daytona International Speedway on the Podium Esports Network. For nearly 65 years, the Porsche Club of America has offered an unparalleled experience to Porsche owners across North America. Now, PCA is proud to offer a new experience to the 130,000 members of the largest single mark car club in the world. Introducing the Porsche Club of America Sim Racing Series in partnership with iRacing and Podium Esports. 60 PCA members will compete for victory with the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car on eight iconic North American circuits. All broadcast live on the iRacing Esports Network. Welcome back here to coverage the Podium Esports Daytona 500, the inaugural event here, and the inaugural special event for Podium Esports, and drivers are on the grid, and it is time to tell you who is starting where for our first edition of the Great American Race. Your pole sitter by virtue of the fastest time in fits qualifying on Friday night is Michael Conti in the 88 for Junior Motorsports. He's joining on the outside of row one by the 47 of Nick Ottinger. Femi Olat won the first duel at Daytona presented by JDR Graphics last night. He'll start inside of row two in the third spot. Seth DeMerchick for Vincere Racing and Peterson Irrigation will start fourth by virtue of his victory in the second duel at Daytona presented by JDR Graphics. John Gorlinski came through the qualifying races after a poor run in the fixed qualifying session on Friday night. He'll start in the fifth spot. Sixth will be Seth the Merchant's teammate that you just heard from a little bit ago, Christian Peterson. Derek Justice in the 31 car will start from the seventh spot. Eight will be the 46 of Jimmy Mullis for Richmond Raceway Esports, and then Logan Kress in the 30, and Ashton Crowner for Burton Kligerman Racing will start from the downtown. Andrew Fash, the third rolling off from the 11th starting spot. Justin Knobloch in 12th. Nick Morse in 13th. Malik Ray in 14th. Tyler Dalton 15th. Adam Benefield 16th. Steve Sheehan in 17th. Justin Levine 8, uh, 18th. Dylan Jones 19th. And Andrew Freynars rounds out the top 20. Colin Bowden will be starting in the 21st position outside of him. Brandon Holder in the 5 car. Chris Simmer will start 23rd outside of him. Tyler Young in the 44th car. Brad here will start 25th. And Graham Bolin in the 26th starting spot. Justin Bolton in 27th. Outside of him, Raul Alves with a very wide car. His number 50 car will start 28th. Aaron McArston, uh, McErton will start 29th. And Ryan Hill in 30th. 
As you see the rest of the starting grid roll off here on your screens, we'll take a moment to look at the track facts here for today's race at Daytona. It's pretty straightforward. It's Daytona International Speedway, two and a half miles around, 31 degrees of banking in the turns, 10 degrees in the trioval, two degrees on the straightaways. We're going for 200 laps, 500 miles, five sets of tires, 100% fuel tanks here. Default weather here in the afternoon with the dynamic sky, so you could see some cloud changes here as we get set for action from the world center of racing a big thank you to all of you for joining us for today's broadcast as we get set to bring you the race to see who will get the $7,500 per share and the GT Omega Racing Simray. Michael Conti leads them to the green flag and we are underway with the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. And Conti will get the jump on Nick Ottinger from JT2 Garden Racing and Conti will lead the field into one. Looks like the Yolan in the 22 is gonna have a pretty good run on the bottom as well and it'll be the inside lane that will pace this field and lead them through one and two and down to the back stretch for the first time. Side by side all the way through the field, two by two, all rows deep still. No one breaking into that inside lane. These guys just trying to sort out where their car is going to run the best, who they want to work with, find their friends in the pack, and get to them to work through. This is a very long race, James. It takes a lot of discipline, a lot of patience to go for 200 laps, 500 miles around Daytona. So these guys are going to show a lot of patience, I do believe. Find their friends in the draft, fall back if they want to be further back in the pack. But the guys up front, that's the best place to be because if they wreck, it's going to be behind you. And we saw that happen a little bit in the qualifying races yesterday. Drivers who thought that pitting might be a good way to get out of incidents, thought that you might be able to survive and get out back there and be okay, but it just didn't work out for a lot of drivers here. And it was a bit of a struggle in a lot of ways. So, though I will say, compared to that race, this race will play out a little bit differently because you do have the ability to ride in the back a little bit. If you so choose, as you see Nick Ottinger drop to the bottom in front of Michael Conti to take control of this race. Yeah, and we are seeing now we already have two packs and Ryan Hill and Will Cooley right there just kind of barely hanging on. I think they're maybe going to make it, maybe close enough to make a rope, but we do have that second group already there. Uh, Justin Bolton now leading up that second group back there in 30th. So uh, did not take long for uh, two packs to really develop here at the start of this race. And we'll see if that is by design or uh, if they're just trying to uh, make it through the first half of this race. They try and sort their way through. You see a lot of drivers already stringing out here. And looks like we have a few folks who are trying to slide towards the back of this field to just sort of escape things. And I look here, John Theodore, you see some of the drivers here. Looks like the 36 of Justin Bolton might be sliding a little bit further back as he gets passed by. It looks like that's the 03 of Chris Cranfield and then Colin Keister, who was the fastest driver in the open qualifying session to earn a provisional for the Daytona 500. Daniel Falking here there as well. But looks like a few of these drivers just sort of waiting in the back and going to try and use that strategy to see if they can survive this great American race. Yeah, you're going to see guys use a lot of different strategies, especially early. Um, you know, the. the Famous quote, I believe, was Richard Petty that in order to finish first, you must first finish. So, particularly at plate tracks where the big one is a real thing, you're going to see a lot of guys uh, trying to play it slave for the first half of the race and just sort of log laps and get through to the finish. Um, I'm personally not usually a big fan of that strategy, but I, I have a little bit different equation running a stream and stuff like that. I find it's more entertaining content for my viewers if I try to get up there and run up front um, as much as possible. And I've also found that, you know, you can, you can get caught up in a wreck hanging out and back. I've been caught up in wrecks trying to run for the front. So uh, it just depends on um, what you want to do as a uh, driver. But certainly I've seen guys win with all forms of strategies, and I've seen all strategies not work out. So a uh, lot, of, lot of early positioning games being played right now. A lot of early positioning games indeed is see up at the front here it's still pretty standard order stuff here you see Femi Olot and the 22 machine for dead zone racing up there he was pretty quick and managed to take advantage it's a pit strategy to get himself in the first group he short pitted everybody in his first duel last night and that ultimately got him in position to win the first duel of Daytona presented by Jamie on graphics one night ago also see the 21 of John Gorlinski in there Logan Press in the 30 also running up there and Derek Justice who we normally see in the 
Truck Series on Sunday nights here for Buddy Lee Sports, which incidentally will be following us here from Daytona International Speedway. The Truck Series will going to do Smyrna later tonight for their regularly scheduled action, but Justice here running in the Podium Esports Daytona 500 and with a pretty stout race as well. You see him in front of Andrew Fass III, that Textromatic Motor Media Machine, and I also see the one car, that's Justin Knobloch, coming underneath Seth DeMerchant, who won the second duel one night ago. A lot of shuffling through the front pack here as they get single file for the first five cars, bringing that bottom line through. Just not enough cars up on the top side. Logan Crest doing everything he can to try and build momentum up there with help from self immersion. Just not enough energy in the high side. So now we'll see kind of what we saw most of the day yesterday, that inside lane prevailing uh, with more energy, more strength, and just a lot of uh, good pushing and shoving going on down there. I don't see any slam drafting yet. Good patient bump drafting in the right positions. You talked about Derek Justice and the way he got into the Daytona 500. A little bit of drama for him yesterday in his race. Came from 19th to finish very high up in the running order. Fourth, I believe, using that shortstop strategy with Femi Olatz. And uh, really worked out for him. It looked like there was a possibility he could not even make it into today's race. And battled through, got that strategy working, and now finds himself up inside the top five of the Daytona 500. Already up into the top five. Pretty solid run for him here. Just looking, uh, and I look back towards the field. We talked a little bit about how we thought Seth DeMarchick and Christian Peterson were going to tag team this race together and run together as much as they could. Those two drivers in the Peterson irrigation machine, the Vincere Racing, they maybe not to too many people surprised have already found a way to hook up here on the high line so they'll be there working together no surprise and then you've got two drivers who you'll see on tuesday night actually yeah two there and you've got the burton clickerman esports driver ashton crowder and then malik ray for richmond raceway esports both running toyota camrys both working together and it makes me wonder where jimmy mullis might be and the answer to that oh he's got Ashton Crowder in a bit of a sandwich there. So Richmond Raceway Esports Driver is right there in front of Ashton Crowder and behind him as well. So I'm looking at the start of this race, and this is another thing that we really need to be paying attention to with the latest build that we had here on iRacing. Right now we are currently at a track temp of 100 degrees, uh, but as we get later in the day, as those shatters really start to creep across the track, and I think that that's going to really lend more to those drivers that are going to be daring enough to use the high side. Uh, we see a lot more drivers that are willing to try it out here early. Uh, not as much success as uh, they are probably hoping for right now. But uh, again, as we get later on into the afternoon, I think that especially uh, those drivers of Seth DeMerch and Christian Peterson, we see them using that high side right now, at least holding strong out there. I think that they will, uh, especially when they will feel a little bit more comfortable later on in the race to really crowd down. Uh, seeing a lot of room there that are given to that 09 of... Uh, uh, Levine down there that I think that uh, once we get later on in the race they'll be uh, be able to use that side draft a little bit more. Justin Levine in the marshmallow machine that Chevy Camaro currently holding down the 13th spot as per timing and scoring so a few names that tripped us up yesterday we had over 170 people to deal with so it wasn't necessarily the easiest of days for pronunciation but just the 43 that we're working with today as you see Malik Ray pacing and running around here in the sort of second pack now they sort of strung out a bit and Levine is the first one who's really trying to make that top side work and he's got help from the Vince Racing drivers and Seth DeMersh and Christian Peterson. And so, we'll wait and see how they sort of shake out. We'll wait and see if they sort of drag and let things happen. But, uh, John Theodore, you're watching all of this play out here and waiting to see how it shakes out. And I look here, you've got about, uh, looks like maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20-ish drivers here in this lead pack, maybe a little bit more than that as we slide back to the bandits and then the gap develops. Daniel Falkingham is the first man who's a little bit further back in 30 seconds. So actually about 30 drivers in that first group, but uh, if you're towards the back of this group, right around that 20th range, I know you said a little bit earlier that you'd like to be a little bit further up towards the front of this field, but if you're already sort of back there, do you decide maybe it might be a little bit easier to go to the back and just wait out with the rest of these guys? Or are you trying to fight your way to the front to make sure you don't lose this lead pack track? If I'm the lead pack draft, I probably want to stay there. Now these guys here um, in this back 10, they're all running single file. You're seeing some nice even spacing. Their main objective is to not lose touch with the lead pack right now. So if you can run five to 10 seconds back and just kind of keep contact, you know that if, the, if, if push comes to shove, if, if this thing does happen to go green the whole way and they get in a situation later in the race where they need to race back up, 
they can scrunch back up and while the lead pack is fighting side by side, these guys will be able to eventually run them down. Um, but you're going to have to pull that trigger probably at about the 50 lap mark to really make it through. There are going to be green flag pick stops. There are going to be things that settle the deck. So these guys in the back right now are not in too bad a shape. They're going to be able to communicate with each other, work some strategy, coordinate pit stops, and make sure that they stick together and can make that move that they need to. Just making sure you stay together and you work together because you are a little bit closer to the cliff's edge, as it were, losing the draft. And I look way towards the back of this field, and I already see two drivers, Donald Pounds and Donald Skalenka. I don't know if this is a strategy move or if they did lose the draft early on, but they are a two-car tandem towards the back of this field. Currently scored in 42nd and 43rd, and I would say probably in danger of losing the rest of this group here. Also might want to watch here to see if Briar the Proud and the 54 machine loses the back of this second pack as well. He would then probably likely drop back to power since going to get and create a third group back there a little bit further back in the draft. But it is still as you were here at the front of this field. Most people trying to go single file. Uh, from about 20th on back and then up in the top 10. But you have to go to right around where Andrew Fayash is, the driver of the number seven machine, the Texomatic Motor Media Chevy Camaro, right there at the edge of the top 10. That's where you see a lot of the side-by-side -side racing happening at the moment. Malik Ray, Justin Levine. I see uh, the 41 of Graham Bowl and the 57. Seth DeMersion jumped to the top side as well. Malik Ray had been down on the bottom, now jumps up top shelf behind Levine bringing the 41 and the 57 with him. So a little bit more energy building in that top lane with Fash out in front of it as he gets up alongside number one of Justin Knobloch. So up the, alongside the uh, sixth car in line or so, trying to build more momentum in there. This is the best run that I think the top side has seen as we've gone through the first 15 laps here. Will anyone ahead of him? Yes, uh, Fash gets one more car up in front of him. Uh, so they'll try and work their way past the 31 of, or the 30 of one, yes, of Derek Justice. That's the 30 of Logan Kress, who jumps back up there as well. So another car added to the high side. Now they move up alongside the 21 of John Gorlinski. They move up alongside John Gorlinski and that 21 Shishi. Logan Kress starting to pull that top line a little bit further to the front of the field. We saw drivers in all the qualifying day races yesterday have a really, really good feel for the side draft. If you could get up there and really make it work. There were a handful of drivers that I saw who jumped out to me personally who I looked at and I said, you know what? If you give them a chance to run on the top side, they know how to side draft well enough that they might be able to make something of it. And Kress was certainly one of those. He was in the top lane for a good chunk of the duel if I remember correctly so no surprise here that the driver the number 30 machine is already up to the top side and currently is trying to work his way into the top five yeah and I'm looking now that we have most of your front pack that is now running side by side I think that that's going to give the chance of uh, uh, the group led by Daniel Falkenham that second group out there that uh, this is their chance if they want to take it they might just be very content to ride back there right now but they do, and especially with that rope that they have right there at Adam Benefield, uh, they can move up and get back to that lead group if they so desire. There, it might not be their plan of action, but with them running side by side up there, if they want to, they could absolutely work together and get caught back up to that lead, uh, lead group. Uh, then that would leave us with a 41 car pack, uh, Donald Powers and uh, Donald Shalinka, uh way off the, the back of the pack right now and are definitely going to be needing a yellow to get caught back up. Of course, I say everything about the outside lane working, and then all of a sudden, Crest decides to drop out of it, so he'll go down to the bottom, and it will just be Andrew Fanos and Justin Levine there, and then it's like Malik Ray, he peaked out there a little bit further back in the field, but uh, you have to go all the way back to, surprise, surprise, Christian Peterson and Seth the Merchant, who currently are being split up a little bit here by the 88 of Andrew, or not the 88, the double zero of Andrew Freenars, who likes to run the 88 normally, but that belongs to the man currently in second, the junior motorsports driver, Michael Conti. So, uh, we'll see how Peterson and Demergent get on. I wonder if they might be dropping to the back just to try and get out of this hornet's nest, as it's were. But uh, for the meantime, they're sort of sliding back on that top side, waiting for the moment to jump in. And uh, I wonder where they're going to try and fall into line here. Uh, they're going to have a long way to, to look back and find if they're going to do it. I don't exactly see a hole. If Levine wants to slide down in front of Derek Justice just like that, he does. So now... The man left out on the uh, outside lane by himself is going to be Andrew Fash. Very lonely feeling when everybody dishes you like that, but look at that. Levine trying to let him in and does. So now uh, what was the two lanes gets down into one consolidated train down on the bottom side. You see these guys helping each other out. They know 
again, it's just too early on into this race to really push the issue or force a guy out there that you're working really well with. You want him to stay there with you and continue to work well together. So now guys just content to ride, ride, ride. And I think that's what we're going to see up until we get to the green flag pit stop cycle. I have a feeling you're probably right about that as we uh, aren't maybe about halfway through this run, just about somewhere in the neighborhood of. So everything's just sort of calm and peaceful for the moment. You're watching here for action. You probably need to slide back to about the three car. Nicholas Morse, again, right there on the edge of the top ten. That seems to be where all the action tends to start here as you see a few more drivers have sort of dropped off the back of this field. So. Yeah, and I'm looking and what I think these guys are doing, and I think that they're able to make that outside work, but as we saw it in uh, one of the qualifiers here last night, uh, one guy was uh, very, very capable of pushing his way up through the field, but wound up blowing his motor by watching his temperatures. I think that you can give a good push here for about a couple laps, but then you need to find your way back down that inside line and cool off your temperatures to mount another run. And I believe that that's probably what we're seeing these guys doing right now is being very methodical, uh, giving a nice push to gain a couple spots for a couple laps and then uh, trying to file their way back into that inside line. Trying to find their way into the inside line here as I look here. I'm just sort of trying to keep track of who's in what pack, who might be sitting where, and some names that you might be aware of. Uh, looking, uh, I'll slide back to this group here that starts with Andrew Farino, who's currently right around the 20th spot. But in here, some names that you might know. Dylan Jones for SKC Racing. Steve Sheehan, who was up till, if my memory serves me correctly, about 2.45 in the morning running a fix to sort of grind out some eye rating before hitting the hay and getting some sleep in advance of today's race. The 44 Tyler Young there, Will Cooley, who had a lot of speed in this qualifying race. He's a man who looks like he can get around here and go pretty quick here. He may have something to say about this when we get towards the end of this race. Ryan Hill, Christian Warren also in here, and the Vincere Racing duo of Santa Mosha and Christian Peterson. I'm looking at Nick Morrison, the number three, getting hung out three wide on the outside lane. Uh, went from about somewhere inside the top 10 to well back about 18th now. So just shipped off a whole bunch of positions as all of his drafting help went away. Uh, they were able to hold it around there no problem. And uh, so Nick Morris drops a lot of positions in a fast manner. The driver out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, not quite the run or maybe he's just doing a little bit of testing to see if a move he could make was going to work. That outside lane once again has built up a lot of considerable energy. A lot of drivers running up there now. Nearly an even split from top to bottom. Getting really interesting here at the front of the field, and we're starting to see that outside line come back up, and that might be the furthest we've seen it come up all race long. As you see Logan Crest, the Pine Piper, up there trying to run alongside it was Femi Olat. It is now John Gorlinski, and then they slide back to Derek Justice here, though Justice is a pretty significant gap to the bumper of Gorlinski, so he may have to run down the 21 a bit just to get this inside line back together. Yeah, and I, one thing I think that uh, these guys are a little more willing to use that outside line is if they do screw up, like we saw Nicholas Morse there, uh, get put into the outside line three wide and then drop all the way back. But uh, these aren't short 30-lap uh, runs, 40-lap races. Uh, we have a little bit more time to recover and try and make some stuff happen. So if I know that I still have uh, over 400 miles left to try and recover, I'm going to be a little more willing to try different stuff and see what I can learn for later on in this race. And if you can get that outside line working and you can find out a way to be fast up there, then you're going to have an advantage over everyone that's just going to be content to ride around the bottom. You're not going to be able to make much progress down there. So learn what you can and see if you could use it later on in the event. See if you can use it later on in the event. That's the key. That's the big key. We'll take a moment here under green flag to let you all know that we have a special discount going on. And oh, by the way, if you hadn't caught it before, we have merchandise. T-shirts and FlexFit hats are now available on the Podium Esports website, PodiumEsports.com forward slash store. We'll get you right there. And it is 20% off here for today only if you order today. It's our way of celebrating this Daytona 500 race day. So if you decide you want to represent some of the best competition in sim racing, head on over to PodiumEsports.com forward slash store to get your hands on some of the newest merchandise available from Podium Esports. Also take a moment to remind you here, while we have a moment under green flag, that today's broadcast of the Daytona 500 is brought to you by Lefty Productions. Lefty Productions is a company that specializes in producing marketing and advertising videos. They have experience with aerial drone video and photography, motion video graphics, training videos, and much, much more. Lefty Productions is also proud to be the producer of all videos for Podium Esports. 
And if you're interested in finding more out about them, you can visit their website at www.leftypro.com. After 25 laps here, an eighth of the way through this podium eSports State Total 500, it is Nick Ottinger leading the field for JTG Darty Racing, and then Michael Conti in the Junior Motorsports 88 machine. Those two had been in front of this field pretty much the entire way, and they paced it very admirably, very consistently, very cleanly here. And it's only when you get back to again right around the top 10 this time it's the eighth spot where you see side by side racing it is currently Andrew Fayos and Derek Justice going side by side as they run through the trial Andrew Fayos has been the absolute uh, resident of the outside lane for much of this race Jimmy Mullis has now jumped up there to join him as well along with a couple of other drivers trying to get some more energy going in that outside lane looks like the number eight of Colin Keister haven't talked about Keister much he had an eventful night last night uh, got his guaranteed starting spot through the Friday night qualifications and then uh, just had a sort of practice session, an extended practice session. Almost came into play if he finished in the 19th to grant an additional spot to somebody else not inside the top 19. But uh, he just, you know, had his own way through that race and now finds himself up inside uh, the top uh, 10 or near the top 10 right now. So good run for the dead zone racing driver as well. So one to keep an eye on there, number eight, Colin Keister. So, no surprise there. Colin Keister had the speed. Didn't quite have the finish he wanted in the duels last night, but he was already locked into the Daytona 500 as the fastest man in Friday night's open qualifying session. We opened up one provisional to the driver who could go out and take their setup and run the fastest time. And Colin Keister, how about this? If you want your mind blown, Colin Keister put down a time of 46.761 around this two and a half mile speedway to lock himself into the Daytona 500, which, oh, by the way, it's you are curious was a full second faster than what Michael Conti ran for the pole under the fixed setup. So they definitely have a little bit of use here, but as always with all podium esports events, this is a fixed setup event and we are here to find the best driver, not necessarily the best setup. So We'll see if Kisu can use that ability here. It's not like he doesn't have driving talent. He's already picked up a victory this season in Iowa in the gold division of the Podium Esports Elite Series, which you can see here on the Podium Esports Network on Thursday nights. But uh, Kisu's got some speed, got some pace, and I have a feeling we'll be hearing from him a few more times before this race ends. Well, James Pike, we are now getting to that time where we need to start thinking about pit stops. Here within the next 10 or so laps, we should see everyone come down pit road. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. I know it's very bright uh, and still hot during the day. Normally, you're going to take two tires to really uh, try and save some time on pit road. Don't uh, use a lot of tires here at this racetrack, but during the heat of the day, maybe uh, maybe a good idea at this point in time. So uh, we'll be interesting. What is your strategy? Is it going to be four tires? Is it going to be two tires? If it's two tires, you take left or rights. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out here in the next uh, 10 or so laps. Well, how about we turn to the man with the racing experience, John Theodore, and ask him what he's thinking here. We know that pit stops can be a tricky thing at Daytona first. Let's talk about what you want to sort of look at for this race in terms of strategy. I figure now, while we're under green flag, you're obviously going to take four tires and fuel, but are there any sort of things that would take place on track that you would sort of take notice of and stop for a moment and think, hmm, maybe it might be worth trying to try something, a splash, two tires, something of that measure, and throw everybody off a little bit, gain some track position. Yeah, so, I mean, track position is going to be a theme, I think, throughout the day. We've been, we've seen as this race has been playing out how difficult it is to make moves forward with that high line really being, you know, having difficulty getting anything going. It, it, we see, it, it looks like it's going to move a little bit forward, but what that means as a driver is I'm seeing it's like it's really hard to make passes on the track. So when I'm coming down pit road for these pit stops, I would probably be looking at just taking two tires. And interestingly enough, for whatever reason, combination of reasons at Daytona with this fixed setup, the lefts actually uh, get more wear than the rights. So I would be looking for guy, a lot of guys to take just two left side tires on this first pit stop and maybe switch and do rights the next time. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was one of the things that affected me uh, last night in the qualifying race. I miscalculated on the amount of fuel to put in. I was on pit road for one and a half seconds longer, and that meant that I, was, I fell back from um, being able to draft with the guys that I wanted to come in and pit with. Just 
that even if it's a second on pit road, that can be a huge difference in terms of track position when you shuffle back out, especially if you lose the pack that you wanted to run with. And John, just while we touched on teammates are trying to come into pit road, talk about the difficulty of getting down to pit speed and to the entry of pit road under green flag conditions here at Daytona, especially since with the way the inside wall sort of funnels everything in, it becomes a choke point right there at the entry of pit road. And it can be tricky for some drivers to actually get on pit road safely. It does. And it becomes the, the real difficulty for me, um, what comes in is at most normal tracks, you're at least using the brake somewhat, especially the as tires wear out, you start using the brake a little bit more and a little bit more. You know, if you think about like at a Texas or a Charlotte or something like that, you'd be using the brake throughout the run. At Daytona, you've got that right foot planted on the gas. You're not touching the brake at all for 20, 30 minutes or something like that. And then you come down to pit road and all of a sudden you have to get really hard on the brake. You want to make sure, I usually like to throw the brake bias as far forward as possible to prevent locking up the rears and spinning the car around. And then the other thing is that you tend to not get a ton of practice because you don't tend to, guys just don't tend to run full fuel runs in practice. So the only time when you really get to practice trying to slow the car down with the tires as worn and as hot as they are right now is in race condition. So it's definitely a challenge as a driver to um, stop the car in as short a distance as possible because you don't want to give up a lot of time braking in loose spots that way, but at the same time not pushing the limit, making a potentially race ending mistake of either spinning getting onto pit road uh, entering too fast and getting a speeding penalty or you know making a mistake when you're actually in the pits um, driving through too many pit stalls too many ghosts or things like that that uh, guys are going to be having to pay attention to as well there's a whole lot of stuff to try to keep in your head and execute properly when you're coming down to make a pit stop under green and yes uh, another point that i had almost missed is i turn now to david schoenhaus the pit road penalties we saw i think will cooley is when he jumps out to me who nearly found himself out of this field last night had the speed and was up near the front of his duel and then i believe got a speeding penalty if i remember correctly and had to come down and serve that and nearly cost himself a chance to run for the 7500 dollar purse but uh, you have to be wary of it and watch for it because especially under green flag conditions if you get caught out in that sense you're in big trouble especially if you end up in a penalty that puts you all alone in the draft you are almost guaranteed to be a sitting duck to go a lap down. Yeah, it, it is definitely going to be one of those things that's considered a, a death sentence at that point under green flag conditions. And it's one of those unforced errors if it's a speeding or driving through too many stalls or extreme ghosting, one of those rules that the admins here at Podium Esports are keeping a big eye on. Um, you know, and then there's the other factor as well of all the guys that are trying to pit with you. You pit in these big packs. Guys have different braking points. They misjudge have different lines taking into the pit road and you can see contact we saw last night Garrett Maines uh, and Blake Neer get together trying to execute a pit stop and Maines race was effectively ended at that point when he had to make another cycle around the racetrack at a reduced speed uh, and so that's something else that you can be subject to is your competition making mistakes sliding the tires getting into you a lot of things can go wrong when you try and execute a green flag pit stop a lot of pressure on at that point and like John Theodore said you're not used to using the brakes, so you get to them, you jump on them all of a sudden, you got to slow down from 200 miles an hour plus down to pit road speed uh, in a certain amount of time, and the car's just not going to do it. You're along for the ride at that point. You might wipe somebody else out as well. So those unforced errors, the uh, mistakes that can be made on pit road can have a huge effect on the way your race can go, but over the course of 500 miles, it's uh, magnified even more. And James, I'm return to you here. Do you feel like there's any advantage just with in terms of where you are in one of these packs to, would you like to try and be on the outside the inside towards the front of this field the back of the field just to make sure that you give yourself a chance at a clean entry on pit road and you don't worry about locking up the brakes or being run into or running into the back of somebody trying to get down the pit road here well one thing that is really good when you are around teammates is you could say uh you take the inside i'm going to take the outside and then you kind of split it up that way uh, you're not really going to have that choice uh, when you're coming down against other people, uh, you can speak with them in the open chat, but also uh, if you give up your strategy too much, uh, it can be difficult. So uh, the one thing that I would like to be is I would like to be up closer to the front of the field. 
obviously. Uh, but the main reason for that is if I get a bad pit stop, or more importantly, if the people around me get a bad pit stop, I still have a better chance of being able to slot in with someone as I come out. So the closer I am to the front, the more error that I have to recover if I make a mistake, but more importantly, if someone else makes a mistake. You can have a fantastic pit stop, and if uh, the people you're pitting with have a bad pit stop, it completely negates everything that you just had and then some. And John, I want to come back to you very briefly here. One more piece, if I can take a moment and sort of roll through everything here. Well, actually, never mind. How about we look at the first of drivers All coming around. down pit road as he's in and see, Nick Ottinger and company, that's one car. The 03 machine and Chris Canfield nearly just completely overshot himself into the grass. Looked like the, uh, is that the 71? Yeah, Donald have Powers spun coming, spun on out out coming on the pit road, correct. Well, Donald Powers spins out coming on the pit road, and uh, the 03 machine of Chris Canfield comes to the grass, so he'll lose a ton of time trying to sort through everything and getting back to pit road, and that leaves the field in the control and the capable hands of Elite Ray. And some of those unforced errors we see there, that's going to affect these guys. They're going to need some help on the track in form of a yellow flag if they're going to get caught back up. And here comes Malik Ray and others coming down to pit road. Will we see more botches on the entry? A real late commitment there. Everyone getting it locked up. John Gorlinski, a lot of lock up there. Ooh, that's a lot of people. <laughs> but that is a huge host of cars. And look, they all got on cleanly. Now, can they get in their stalls without making contact? Looks like it. Everyone kind of gave away with it here. The second pack doing a very nice job. I see the 41 overshoot the pit stop. I think I saw Logan Crest get into somebody on the exit, or entry rather, of pit road. And I, I couldn't quite tell who it was. I might mic track a little bit. I see a little bit of damage on that 30, and I do believe it was the, actually, no, it was the 41 machine that got into him. So the 41 machine, trying to find who that is on the board here. And the 41 machine belongs to Graham Bolin. So Bolin and Logan Crest get together on pit road. Uh, this is going to be very tricky. There's a lot of cars. They did an amazing job getting on the pit road, but now it's going to be even more difficult to get off a of pit road. There's a lot of cars, and you have to stay on the apron until you get to the backstretch. That is not just a rule that we have in podium. This is a rule now in iRacing, and they will give you a black flag. You see that blue cone there on the inside line as they come across it? Uh, and uh, everyone did a great job of getting completely fouled through there. Uh, very clean and impressive pit stop by these guys. We'll see how things shake out here. I wonder if there might be penalties for the 41 just with how quickly he was coming into pit road. I actually did not see any other incidents of notes here during that cycle of pit stops, which came through very, very quickly. Everybody done within about a lap or two as you see everybody blend back together. So not much difference here. I was going to ask John Theodore about the advantage of short petting here in a green versus staying out, but I don't think we're going to see much of it as we see Nick Ottinger on the high side. Three ride there. I see the 24 machine in the middle of that. That's Colin Bowden, the Rainbow Warriors paint shot and the number 24 machine. So Bowden trying to sort through everything and make sure he's okay as they go two by two here and sort themselves into this big pack again and blend themselves back together. No surprise to see Andrew Fash up on the top side leading Steve Sheehan, Colin Bowden, Nick Ottinger, and Jimmy Mullis right now. Two cars on the bottom, Malik Ray, the eight of Colin Kiesi. Here comes John Gorlinski as well. And the 30 of Logan Cresso as this pack gets reformed. Fayash will drop down to the bottom side to pick up Malik Ray, leaving Sheehan to the top. As Sheehan, will, I think, will edge him out to the line right now, getting a good push from behind from Colin Bowden. So look at this, James, how this front pack really got shook up on these Shane's Green Flag pit stops. Also of note here, Tyler Young in the number 44 machine now stopped here on the apron right in front of the pit entrance. And I wonder if there are troubles for the 44. Didn't quite see what happened to him. I wonder maybe if there might be engine trouble on that car, but he is pulled into pit road and i wonder if he may be done for the day yeah that's going to be a big uh hole to climb your way out of uh losing a couple laps it is still and especially the way that this race has gone we've gone through one complete round of pit stops now so this is going to make it even more difficult here uh an even higher likelihood that we are going to stay green even with the, the much higher intensity up here at the front of the pack we see these guys having no problem uh going to that high side now uh, it is no longer a bottom feeding fest and we're seeing a big battle here for the lead this is going to be really uh a intense moment here as they come around the lap car three wide they're going to stay up there and they're going to get through here just fine but uh we're in a very good situation and we're probably going to have a lot of green flag laps here from here on out 
A lot of green flag laps here from here on out. Potentially, potentially. I figure it will probably pick up a little bit more as we get closer to the checkered flag. But for the moment, everybody running uh, relatively peacefully here around Daytona International Speedway. Also can note that Tyler Young ran out of fuel on the way to his pit stall. So not huge trouble, at least mechanically, for the number 44 machine. But he is now two laps down and is going to need a lot of help in order to get back in contention for the victory here at Daytona. That usually tends to be a sort of terminal, I guess, penalty problem, at least for your chances to win the race. Yeah, that definitely hurts your uh, overall opportunity when you run out of fuel, and that tells you how close these guys were cutting it. Uh, and he you know, made that mistake, and that's going to really hurt his chances of, of getting into a good position here, barring something else happening. And again, we're not uh, even a quarter of the way through the race here just yet, but I'm looking at this lead pack of about 14 cars anchored by Dylan Jones in the 11. Uh, that's really the split right now as the rest of these drivers completed their service, and Tyler Dalton's bringing uh, Justin Knobloch with him. So a couple more drivers about to join the fray, but a big separation that tells you just how much gap can be gained or lost on the exchange of green flag pit stops. The guys that execute really well, you see the advantage that they get. The guys that didn't do such a good job or didn't have the cleanest entry or exit off of the service lane, well, they can lose a lot of time. They have to fight really hard to catch back up. They will have to fight really, really hard. And at this moment here, now that we've completed all of our green flag pit stops, we're going to turn it to our producer, Cisco Scaramuza, who has a few little notes and updates here from the Twitch chat and a few more bits of information to head out to you all. Hey, guys, thank you very much. This is Cisco down here in the production truck as we complete lap number 46 right here of 200 here in the Podium Esports Daytona 500. A little bit of break to the commentators, and that'll allow us the opportunity to go through and do some business. Right now, we do want to give a shout out to uh, Chuck Danson, who subscribed to us with Twitch Prime. Want to say thank you very much to him. Also, to Ricky Harden21. Ricky, thank you very much for subscribing once again to Podium Esports and hitting us with that Twitch Prime. Always, always appreciated. Uh, I, there was one last cheer that we missed last night. A couple cheers, actually. Uh, Randy cheered us 100 bits, uh, as well as Gary. David Kilo subbed for two months in a row. Uh, Emma Stierga subscribed to us for uh, $4.99 at Tier 1 sub, as well as Ballistic Kill. 383 gave us a sub there, as well as Yeehaw got a uh, huge sub during the big sub train that we saw last night uh, during the qualifiers and everything going on there. So that was really cool to see. So we'll run quickly through your standings as they sit right now. You watch Andrew Fayash lead the rest of the field right now over John Gorlinski. Colin Keister right now sitting in that third position. Malik Ray is fourth. Logan Kress sitting fifth. Sixth is going to go to Derek Justice. Seventh going to go to Michael Conti. Eighth to Nick Ottinger. Jimmy Mullis is going to, right now running ninth. Tenth is Justin Levine. Eleventh is going to go to Ashton Crowder, the driver out of Cl Burton Kligerman Esports. Twelfth going to go to Colin Bowden. Thirteenth is Dylan Jones. Fourteenth to Tyler Dalton. Fifteenth to Justin Knobloch. Sixteenth going to go to Steve Sheehan. Seventeenth going to go to Raul Alves. Eighteenth right now is Nicholas Morse. Nineteenth to Andrew Freenars. Twentieth is Ryan Hill. Twenty-first, Will Cooley. Twenty-second, Brandon Holder. Femi Olat running twenty-third. Twenty-fourth to Brad Deer. Twenty-fifth to Christian Peterson. Twenty-sixth is Seth the Merchant. 27th, Chris Samar. 28th is Adam Benefield. Graham Bolin runs 29th. And Justin Bolton rounds out your top 30. 31st, Daniel Falkingham. 32nd, Matt Cucker. Briar LaPrad running 33rd. 34th to Gary Sexton. 35th, just Josh Bonwell. 36th to Chris Shearburn. 37th to Kyle Brummett. 38th right now, Aaron McEachern. 39th, Chris Canfield. Kenneth McCullough Jr. running 40th. Donald Powers, Donald Skalinka, and Tyler Young round out your 43-car field. Still everybody on track at the moment. Tyler Young right now three laps down. The rest of your field from Chris Canfield on back is one lap down. And that has been a quick Podium Esports race break. We're going to send it back up to the booth now with James Pike, David Shieldhouse, James Grujula, and John Theodore.
Pack could get there. They got to stay in line. They're doing a nice job of doing that, and that's that's really what it takes to catch up. You have to push as hard as you can. You got to be perfect. Ride right in line there with the car in front of you. Get the maximum effect of that draft. So TD can lead that group around, catch back at the lead draft. That'll be good for them. But I'm looking back in this third pack, like you said, led by Will Cooley. You see Brandon Holder, Femi Olaf, Brad Near, Christian Peterson, Seth the Merchant. Uh, so that's uh, backwards as far as 26th right there in that group to uh, Vincere Racing Cars at the back of that third pack. Not where they want to be right now, James, I can tell you that much. Not where they want to be right now. But for now, we have a very special announcement for you all that we want to bring in to the Spodium Esports States on the 500. So just check your screens here for a moment. You'll find out a little bit more. information on that in the coming weeks but let's just say that july 2019 will be different and be fun perhaps mr shuthouse as a sim racer that i enjoy spending time with once said it's fun to have fun so take that for what you will but i'm looking forward to july of 2019 Bringing a little more fun to this wonderful hobby known as sim racing here on the iRacing service should be a good time, so stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss that. And I think in fairness, uh, we can give a few bits and pieces out to the audience here. But for those who have been asking, well, what are you doing once the seasons wrap up here in July 2019? We have plans, and those plans will come out in the coming weeks to you all. And for more information on that, just make sure you keep an eye on the Podium Esports website to see what will follow the seasons once they wrap. Getting back to racing here, we are seeing now back to our single file that everyone here has been really, really upset about the last couple days. But if you're going to win... You need to be smart and you need to let the race and do what is best for your race. But right now, just needs to settle through and kind of make it through. Click off some laps. We got one green flag pit stop in here. And we typically see this in all restricted plate races. But don't worry, once we get later on into the races, we see the 88 now uh, making uh, a huge move there on the back stretch and forcing his way through there. That's Michael Conti in the Junior Motorsport Chevy. Uh, making a move there on the number 31 of Derek Justice, kind of forcing his way through almost one of those bump and runs that John Theodore was talking about earlier uh, to try and get his way through to maintain that bottom line. But uh, yeah, right now, well, we're seeing a couple more things, and I think later on these, we're going to see these guys try and risk it to get that biscuit. <laughs> try and risk it to get the biscuit. You almost make me want to go ahead and do a... Uh, I guess I'll place myself here on broadcast Bojangles more than anything else. So... And let, let the biscuit wars begin between Bojangles and Chick-fil-A and Biscuitville and nowhere else. I, I wonder who Chat's going to throw in here. Carl's Jr. A red, a red lobster, lobster doesn't count. That's, that's lobster, no, those are cheese. Those are che cheese. These biscuits don't count. Carl's Jr. Although they are parties, good. depending they are on which good. part of the country you're in. Uh, yeah, I forget they do biscuits, but usually they come in like food in them. I was just thinking like biscuit biscuit pump. You guys, you guys are missing out. We have Norma's down here in Texas. Oh, because everything's greater in Texas, I see. Yes, okay, I'm glad that you agree with me that everything is better in Texas. Oh, I say that sarcastically. I thought it was bigger, not better. Yeah, exactly. It is all. All, all bigger and better. It's, it's better how much bigger it is, and it's bigger because how much better it is. John Theodore, what do they have out in St. Louis that's worth a shout here in the Great Biscuit Debate? Uh, we got Steak and Shake out here in uh, St. Louis as far as diners go. Um, and then there's also uh, one of the local favorites is uh, City Diner if you're looking for some really good biscuits. Yeah. Steak and Shake, no surprise there. I would have thought that would have come from our Indiana crowd. We know Steak and Shake is long, long, long time roots in the Indianapolis area. But City Diner in St. Louis, a place to add to your list. Go in there and tell them that John Theodore recommended you, and who knows? Uh, maybe we can get the, Theodore, you ought to get a little deal with them set up on your stream. You know, if it's, 
50% off here. As you see the battle for the lead shape up and get a little bit tighter. It's the eight of Colin Keister. We said he had speed. He was the fastest qualifier in the open qualifying session. Knows how to get around Daytona. No surprise here. He's bringing Derek Justice with him at the 24 of Colin Bowden on the outside. And right on board with the ice cream machine. Derek Justice doing a nice job. He and Colin Keister have a lot of years of experience riding uh, around a racetrack with each other. I can tell you that much. I've been a part of it too with them uh, for many, many years. So they're very accustomed to being around one another. Good rivalry between those two drivers too. Very fast in their own regard. But uh, working together here with help from Colin Bowden in the uh, Rainbow Warriors machine, that 24. So nice to see that paint scheme back on the 24 at Daytona. It brings back a lot of fond memories there. But look at Keister, ditch Justice down to the bottom side. Goes down in front of Andrew Fash. Put Colin Keister to the front. Colin Keister now to the front of the podium Esports State Tunnel 500 for a little bit. But look at the run that Derek Justice on the top side with the 24 of Colin Bowden. And then it stalled out because they just don't have enough help and they got too separated. So I almost thought that Justice might be able to pull in front of Colin Keister. But as it stands, it looks like that Keister will manage to hang on to the race lead. Yeah, right now we're looking... Uh, we have 19 cars that are here in this lead pack uh, with uh, Colin Keister now taking the lead. By the way, up 34 positions. Uh, <laughs> he started uh, 35th in this race here today and has now taken the lead here on lap 62. Uh, all green flag laps here, by the way. And then we go all the way back to, uh, I believe, the 18th position uh, with uh, Nicholas Morse and 1.3 seconds back. So uh, we still have a lot of cars still here in this lead pack. And... Uh, that second group is still, uh, you know, just only a couple seconds back, and they are just kind of chilling. Currently led up right now by Will Cooley in that 19th position, the number 25 car. So wait till a little bit later. Let's see if uh, those guys are able to make up that time here on the next pit stop. But still many cars here. Again, 38 cars still on the lead lap. Uh, nope, just went to 37. Wow, there's a big development, and Malik Ray has lost connection to the server, so Malik Ray in big trouble here, and now already a lap down on the pylon, so for the fans of the number four Sunoco machine for Richmond Raceway Esports, uh, might just be a little bit of a bit of bad luck that keeps him out of contention for the win here in the podium of Esports States on a 500, but Malik Ray disconnected from the server, so I imagine he'll try and rejoin, but now we'll need a significant amount of help in order to be in the hunt for the victory. A uh, big change in the landscape there without Malik Ray in the Sunoco machine up front anymore. That's uh, one less bullet for a lot of these guys to have to dodge as well, but one less fast car out of the front group. And we've seen Malik Ray use the bottom and the top side, not afraid to go up there if need be, but no longer a factor in the race as it stands right now. If he's able to rejoin, he's going to need some help to get back on the lead lap and get back up there and fight for this, but really bad oh, for Malik. Man. Just a he huge stroke of bad luck hearing that the game crashed on the late race stream so uh, I suppose for anybody watching in the multi twitch I imagine it would have been a horror show probably still is a horror show and I, I figure Malik's probably really gutted I know he was really nervous coming into today uh, I wanted to chat with him but he was so nervous that he said just give me some peace so we left him his peace pre-race and uh, just not going to be the finish that he wanted tonight here. Malik Ray very likely out of contention for victory here in the Daytona 500 through no one's fault. Just uh, every once in a while you have a glitch in the software, bad connection, and it just happens that this is about the worst time <laughs> that you want to have one. And right now we're seeing the number 24 Colin Bowden did lead that last lap here. Uh, that outside line, they have no problem going up there now. Uh, so bottom line, be gone. Uh, we are racing here all across the Daytona International Speedway here now. As you see, as we're going to come through here, uh, still turns three and four, still in plenty of shade. Uh, but once we start coming down here, uh, maybe just a little bit of shade. Maybe that front grandstand is barely starting to creep on to the front stretch here. Uh, but you go down all the way to one and two, and uh, we have a lot of shade and getting a lot cooler. Already dropped seven degrees since the start of this race, so uh, it's going to make it a lot easier to use that outside line and keep that momentum up. I'm going to turn to John Theodore here because he just made a very good point to me that this top line here, as the rubber builds up, is starting to come in, and I think that lines up pretty well with something that we said in the pre-race show, where as the temperature begins to drop and as we lay more rubber down on the racing surface, John, I have a feeling we're going to see more and more drivers trying that top line as a way to gain a few spots on the racetrack. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, so it's, it's a number of factors that kind of uh, come together when you're looking at this. The, the, the track's getting hotter, especially in the lane where most of the drivers are running. So when the drivers are running on the low lane, that puts more track temp in there um, as it goes along. Also, rubber going in, that takes away a little bit of grip. Uh, and then the other thing is that as the race goes on, the intensity is going to pick up. You're going to start seeing guys run closer together. You're going to start seeing those little checkups, and then you're going to start see guys be more willing to try to make aggressive plays up to the high line. All of that is just going to increase in a general, um, you know, just ramping up the intensity as we click off laps, as we get closer to the uh, money lap. And... Um, you know, you're, you're really seeing that play out right now with these guys. You know, as, as we get deeper into the run, the tires wear out a little bit. We often think of um, Daytona being one where you can just run flat out, and that's very true when you're running one car by yourself. But when you get into a pack and when you're in that draft situation, you're going faster, you're losing some front down force. You actually do, as the tires wear out, do have to crack that throttle a little bit to keep the car. It's going to want to jut out about a half lane up, and if you've got someone right next to you, you'll hit them if you do that. So you have to crack the throttle, and you have to lift a little bit. Uh, so that gives the hot, that start, what that does is all those factors coming together starts making um, possibilities where the highlight can make moves. As you see Bowden right now going for the lead up on the highlight. And I know, Benner, you saw Malik Ray on your screens just a moment ago. The driver of the number four Shinoko Toyota Camry is currently scored dead last in the field, six laps down after that connection issue. But here's the thing. It's not like he doesn't have any damage on the car because that car is clean. And so what I think he's going to try and do is find his way eventually back up to the lead pack and work primarily with his teammate from Richmond Raceway Esports, the number 46 of Jimmy Willis, who currently sits in the 10th spot. And how interesting is that going to be, Mr. James Kuhula, just to try and find your way in there as a lap car? And, you know, how do you treat that if you're not really in contention for the race win, but at the same time, you're still trying to help your teammate who is right there in the thick of things. Mullis currently running in the top 10. It's not like Mullis couldn't use the help if he needed it. Oh, you could. Uh, I've, we've been in this situation before multiple times with teammates, and there are multiple things you can do. You can help out your teammate by, or you, and if you don't have a teammate, if you're not able to get to Jimmy Mullis and uh, help him out, you can help someone else out while also helping out yourself. Uh, it is possible. Six laps is going to be a tough chore to try and get through here, but his car is not damaged. Uh, he's going to try and really here for the next 100 laps or so to really try and get as many of those laps back as he can. Uh, do alternative pit strategies and just hope that the cautions fall his way. Uh, but at a certain point, you're going to have to give up the ghost and uh, you could just go and be full blown. Uh, how can I help my teammate? How can I get up there? Uh, I can't benefit any more from this race, but I could absolutely help out my teammate, which is good for both of us. Uh, and so that will be probably what we'll be looking at here later on in the event, uh, but you you can't give up quite yet. There's been some stranger things that have happened. Bill, yeah. as we get sent to run through this next bit of things here, as I hear uh, there was a big wreck at the Real Life Daytona just a moment ago, but uh, in this Daytona 500, Colin Keister is still your race leader here as we work lap 72 of 200 of note. You see the 205 there up on the screen. That is in the event that we need the green white checker finish. We do have one attempt available for drivers here at Daytona, so we'll see if we need it. And we may end up using it, not totally certain, but uh, as of now, if we don't need it, the scheduled distance will be 200 laps, 500 laps. Well, you know, a green white checker would just be the uh, cherry on top, but so far these guys have shown a penchant for not uh, having any issues or creating any contact so we may not even have to worry about that but we're still only here on lap 72 we get to lap 172 might be a different story at that point james and you know for what it's worth green white checker a little bit of intrigue we saw a couple of uh, instances of that yesterday in the duels in the last chance qualifiers running up against the uh race distance and time distance that were allocated for those events and create a little bit of interesting layer of complexity as well as guys race against the clock not an issue here today but i wouldn't be completely surprised if we did find ourselves in a situation where a green white checker would be needed 
we could use a green white checker i know we definitely came up against yellow flags especially at the end of the duels races as, as i see replays of that wreck in daytona down the clash my goodness do we just clean out everybody but uh you know it, it's definitely something i think we're gonna have to watch for and we see the aggression level be relatively calm and peaceful for the moment but these can't last for forever, right? We saw it get up in every single race, especially the LCQs. Those were particularly notable and the amount of incidents and wrecks that they had just with drivers trying to go everywhere after it did. Yeah, as uh, you know, you well noted in the clash, I think we lost 90% of the field there and we had some pretty big wrecks yesterday and that was just the sense of urgency, knowing what was on the line to make it to the big show here today. Guys making some pretty serious moves. I see one car making a big serious move. That's Ashton Crowder in the 77 going outside of Raul Alves there for about the 10th position. And it looks like Colin Bowden's the man stuck up on the high side for about that third or fourth position as well. So everybody once again here seemingly resigned to the bottom side, getting uh, perhaps anticipation of the next round of green flag pit stops. These guys have some experience now after the first round. We'll see if they cut down on the mistakes and or, or there are some more mistakes in this lead pack gets whittled down even more. If this week pack gets whittled down a little bit more, and I think as I just look here towards the back of it, the lead pack ends with the nine of Brad Near, that runner forward, forward fusion there. So he's the last man sitting here in this group, and then you've got a second pack here, a little bit further back of lap down drivers, and I'm trying to figure out where the third is. Here we are, Daniel Falkenham and company there, sort of running, coming out on turn two, and uh, just a whole host of people just sort of hanging out here, but there's a lot of different strategies here in play at Daytona. The key is that you just don't want to be the lone wolf riding out there all by yourself without the draft because you're going to get sucked up into somebody else's pack at some stage. And this is something of note. Uh, last, everyone pitted on lap 40 last time. There's a couple guys that pitted on lap 39, and the problem with pitting on lap 39 is that does not get you to lap 200, which is where we will be ending this race here today. Uh, the majority of the field did stop on lap 40, though, so as long as there was no issues uh, fueling up the car, then uh, these guys should be able to make it now, uh, again, with the pit stop that we have coming up here uh, easily within the next uh, five laps. Uh, that should get you to the end of the race after this next one. Uh, we just have two more pit stops after that, which is just crazy to think that we can get this whole race done uh, in just four pit stops. But uh, without yellows here, uh, there is really not a whole lot to, to worry about with strategy as far as the fuel and everything goes. But uh, tires, that's going to really start coming into play. Uh, again, we've dropped now 10 degrees from the start. If you did not take four tires on that first pit stop, well... Uh, maybe now you can maybe start risking it and maybe trying uh, two tires here, saving a little bit of time and getting yourself in a better position. Get yourself in a better position here. And uh, we'll welcome the people here who uh, are just checking out what we're doing here as we have a red flag right here in the real life flash of Daytona. So if you want to watch racing and continue to watch racing here, we won't be affected by rain. It's bright and sunny here in the instant time. For those of you who are curious, it's 5.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the default day here in iRacing, May 15th. Surely that's going to be a holiday on social media in some way, shape, or form when we get to it later this year. But currently just hanging out here and watching Colin Keister pace this field. Andrew Fayos just sort of stuck there on the top side with not a lot of help. He may go towards the back of this back, but Keister leading the top 20. Right back to the front for Colin Keister, me, John Gorlinski, Michael Conti, Nick Ottinger. Uh, those two, particularly Conti and Ottinger, the front row that started this race, they haven't really faded outside of the top five at all, I don't think, at least through the first 78 laps, except for the cycle of green flag stops. Very clean, very tidy, those guys, but Colin Keister out front doesn't have his uh, favorite drafting partner in Michael Guest. Got uh, caught up uh, yesterday, not able to make it into the event. That was another guy that suffered from a pit road mistake. Took himself out of the opportunity to get in today's race, but doesn't need him. It looks like for Colin Keister out front looking good. Got uh, Gorlinski pushing from behind, and I think all these guys right now with about 39 laps or so since they last pitted. Just getting ready to make that next round of green flag stop, setting up for that, and that's why I don't think we see a second lane on the high side. Don't think we're going to see too many drivers here on the high side, and especially at this point now that you don't have everyone bunched up together like we did at the first round of green flag pit stops. So I figured, John Theodore, do you change anything for the second round of pit stops? Are you trying to tweak your car a little bit in some way, shape, or form, or just save yourself the trouble of having to worry about all the crazy misses? We see one car come down pit road early. It's the 25 of Will Cooley. There's not a lot that you can change in a fixed setup 
on the car. Um, you're basically just going to come down and uh, get fuel and you know, kind of like I was talking about before, if you took two lefts last time, you'll take two rights this time. Um, vice versa, if you did the opposite. So, uh, you know, the main thing is you want to drop down, spend as little... Uh-oh. Trouble cars here. Yeah, well, you just saw a car uh, miss pit road and had to go back out onto the track. Uh, he was able to get back going again. We should see them going slow here around turns one and two right now by themselves. But I uh, said contact uh, coming in. Uh, yes, that was exactly who that was as uh, uh, the 39 car coming down into pit road. Just misses entrance and everyone else comes down on pit road here. Another fantastic pit stop by everyone here. Uh, no troubles here on the next uh, pit stop and everyone gets down clean and we'll see if they exit clean. That'll be the big question here as we wait to see this next group here. Andrew Fayash will be coming down this time. He's currently scored as the race leader, and he's being caught by a second group here. That includes Tyler Dalton, Andrew Friedars. I see Brandon Holder in there and Brad Neer. All of them currently scored in the top five. Fayash, Dalton, Fairnars, Holder, Neer, Benefield. These guys have not pitted yet. Benefield leading a pack of cars. He's got Justin Bolton uh, behind him. He's got the 36. Yeah, Bolton. He's got... Uh, the four of Malik Ray helping out as well, but these guys will peel off and head down pit road, leaving Ray all by himself uh, with others chasing up behind him. So Benefield leading this pack down. Nice and clean, no problem there. A lot of space for these guys to get down there. Look at the 36, Justin Bolton. Haven't talked about him a whole lot yet today. Driving for the team, doing a nice job. Gets into the stall nice and clean. They'll get the service completed on that 36. He'll rejoin the race once they're done. Trying to piece together everything here, and it looks like... Uh, Colin Keister already had things set up. Yeah, Colin Keister, I think, should be the race leader win. It cycles back around, being caught currently by that number 47 machine of Nick Ottinger for JTG's early racing. So Ottinger will lead the second group up here and come right up on the back bumper and decide to pass Colin Keister altogether. So watch this outside lane go for it. It's Nick Ottinger, John Gorlinski, the 24 of Colin Bowden, and the 11 of Dylan Jones right in there in that first pack. And we're seeing a lot. When they were coming off a of pit road, they were bumping each other, going side by side on the apron. Track position means that much here to these guys here in the late stages here after the second pit stop. We're still at lap 82 now. Uh, still no yellow flag, and we're seeing those guys are able to stretch it one more lap into getting passed up to there. Uh, and actually, uh, we look at that 19 of uh, Tyler Dalton and the number uh, 00 there of uh, Feynarge. Uh, they were able to stay out one lap later, and look how much time they gained up. They were running back there uh, in the right around 20th position, and now they're easily going to find themselves here in the top 10. Some fantastic pit strategies there by those two and the seven there of uh, Andrew Fayash. Oh, we have two cars around here. The 44 is around here on uh, off of turn four. The 44 machine in trouble here at Daytona International Speedway. Tyler Young in the 44. Big damage to the front of that machine here as we try and figure out what happened to looks like uh, looks like the 44, you see the replay, just got turned there by the 03 machine of Chris Canfield. Uh, don't know if that was a bumper incident or whatnot, but Canfield got in the back of, yeah, Vaughn Canfield got into the back of that machine, and all of a sudden Ryan Hill had nowhere to go either. So Hill with a lot of damage to the front end of the 55, and I would say it's very likely that those two have just seen their chances to win this race cut short early. No yellow flag, though, as those two boats spun on the apron. Looking at how this all really shook out, as you see Ryan Hill nowhere to go. Tyler Young was catching up to a slower pack of cars, a couple cars, Brandon Holder and Aaron McEckern uh, on the low side, and he sort of pinched down there uh, with Malik Ray on the high side and Hill coming fast on the outside, really just no place to go. Had to jam on the brakes, and Chris Canfield right there just sends. Oh, that was a that was a rough hit, so. Unfortunately for those guys, the race is gonna end for them, I do believe, but we are still under green and uh, get that second cycle through of the pit stops. Look at how the field's been broken up now, James. A couple of packs, about six or seven cars each. A lot of packs in here. Also want to note, right before that incident, Logan Crest was black flagged for driving through too many pit stalls on the exit of pit road. So the number 30 machine going to be in some trouble here. And he's already got some damage to that number 30 as well. But I want to go back to talk about that wreck. John Theodore, you're the man with the experience here. Getting around cars who are coming back up to speed and lap traffic and the differences in pace between cars who have been running at speed for a few laps once they come off pit road versus the cars who are on their outlap. It's about 
about 10 to 15 miles an hour. And depending on where you catch these drivers at certain points on this racetrack, it can be really easy to pass them. But as we saw with the 44 machine and Ryan Hill, it can also be very difficult as well. It creates a real challenge because especially like, so you, these guys are in a draft and you're, you know, bite nose to tail. So the guy in the front can see really easily and anticipate when that car's coming and plot a course around him. And unless you're two or three wide when you catch that car, it's not going to be a real problem. But the guy 10th on back can't see anything except for the rear spoiler of the car in front of him because you're so tucked up on that rear end because that's what you have to do to race quickly here at Daytona and maintain um, competitive pace and not and try to either catch the pack in front of you or keep maintain distance from the pack behind you. So the reason why you see a lot of these stack ups is it's usually not right up in the front but it's usually like six seven cars back where they are not necessarily where exactly where those lap cars are going to cycle out as the field starts snaking around them it just gets progressively uh, dicier. Um, trying to gauge the closing rate and also not run into someone else as you're trying to work your way around. And can confirm from race control that uh, no yellow flag for that incident as both drivers spun off of the racing surface and sort of self cleaned themselves out of turn four. And then there was no one in the vicinity of them sort of running past them. So no threat of anyone hitting those drivers once they wrecked. So we stay green flag racing here at Daytona. And it is Michael Conti in the 88 who currently has jumped up towards the front of this for you. Well, I'd take that. Yes, no, Michael Conti and Nick Ottinger and company all just hanging out here at the front of this race. Actually, no, I'll take it back. Colin Keister the eight because I can't count, but they're all in that pack. <laughs> Counting not required, at least not yet. It's only lap 88, but yeah. Colin Keister is using the 41, I believe, Graham Bolin as a drafting partner. This gets real tight down the back straightaway, squeezing three wide with a slow car on the bottom. Everyone's going to make it through, but Keister decided it was time to, to jump in front of the slower car. That was a 30 of Logan Crest that they were working past. But this pack now uh, features probably... Well, that's back to the 77 of Ashton Crowder in 15th. So your lead pack, about 15 cars strong, plus a couple of lap down vehicles. And uh, from there, it's about a second and a half back to the next pack, led by Justin Levine. So looking at the top side here, Colin Bowen in the 24 is up to Steve Sheehan. We haven't had the chance to talk a lot about the driver of the number six machine, a regular in the Podium Esports Elite Series Gold Division that you can see here on the Podium Esports Network on Thursday nights here. And Sheehan running up there. He's got one of the Vincere racing machines behind him, that 57 of Seth DeMersen just sort of hanging out here and waiting to see how things are going to shake up. Yeah, and we're seeing there uh, a little bit of movement there on that outside line. Colin Bowden has been very impressive there with Steve Sheehan on that outside line. John Gorlinski looked like he wanted to go up there. He's going to stay down there on that inside line. Uh, but we're seeing that outside line again, and those that are able to make it work, those are the guys that we constantly see heading back up there towards the front of the field. So the inside line is probably where everyone wants to run the winner of this race is going to be the person that could use that outside line successfully. Well, we'll see about that. I'm not necessarily convinced that the outside is going to be the place that you want to be at the end of this, but there's no denying that if you know how to side draft, you can use it to get up towards the front of this field as you see that 24 machine of Colin Bowden doing pretty well so far. And we've seen a few drivers here who know how to make the outside work. If you can really piece it together, you can gain some positions up there, especially as the inside bunches up as they come back to each other, trail break to make sure that they close the gaps in between themselves. Usually if you're on the outside, you have more of an opportunity to run flat out, and it allows you to gain a few spots while everybody gets their ducks in a row. Per se. Ducks, a little foreshadowing? A little foreshadowing. <laughs> I have a couple instances of foreshadowing here today, but yeah, you know, Colin Bowden seems to really like the outside lane. Steve Sheehan more than happy to run there with him as well, and uh, I think, uh, think those are the only two right now that are in that area of running the high side, and they're managing to hold on pretty well. They're up there alongside the second or third place car on the bottom side, so we'll see how well they can hang in that spot. I imagine they will fall back as there's just no help behind them. Everybody still down on the yellow line, as we've seen for much of this race, as we're within 10 laps of getting to halfway. 
and that's what I expect, guys. Just ride, 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 and that's really all you have to do. It's a whole different approach to a 500 miler than your average, uh, you know, league race, which might be 40 or 50 percent, or even jumping to an official race. Uh, it's a much different approach, different discipline required, different level of patience in how you approach this long distance. But look at Logan Cress and Ashley Crowder jump to the high side, try to come to the rescue of Steve Sheehan and Colin Bowden. Will Tyler Dalton poke up? No, he'll stay on the bottom side. So looks like it's a whole train of cars on the inside and four brave enough to go up top. If you can get up there and be brave enough, then you will maybe potentially find your way up into the front of this field. But you will have to use it at some point, especially if you're way, way back in the back of this pack. As you see Bowden and company starting to fall back off the front of this field. Bowden already back towards where Michael Conti is in that number 88 for Junior Motorsports. Currently scored in the eighth spot as they crossed the line that last time by. So we're now coming up on halfway here within the next few laps and we still have not had a yellow. Uh, I'm curious of what these guys are thinking. Oh, as we see, ooh, Don't that was say a, a push. It. Don't that, say that it. Was a, that was a push gone almost wrong there. As you saw the 46 there, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how uh, he was able to hold on to, uh, uh, to that one of Jimmy Mullis getting pushed down the back stretch and uh, everyone kept it straight there. And, uh, Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ignore that thought because we've gone caution free here this entire time. I don't want to jinx this. I hope that caught. I hope that. Yeah, caught. I heard it. Yeah, was yeah, we're we're not, yeah, we're knocking 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 on wood here. <laughs> oh, I thought that was a slow clap. Uh, no. Does that sound like hands to you, David Schildhouse? You don't know what you do with your hands or what? you know. Come on. <laughs> uh, clip it. Clip it. So, someone, we have to hold the man responsible for his faux pas, do we? So, David Schildhouse, I have a feeling you're going to end up on a few clips here in a little bit. But, yeah. Wouldn't be the first uh, time. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be the first time now, would it? But I, 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 I'd rather not, to be fair. But that just seems to be our luck here at Podium News Sports. Every time we talk about these things on the network, they happen. So, it, it's sort of like rain, which I guess we can talk about now that the class is open. So I can talk about rain. We're not going to have rain here uh, in this version of Daytona, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here with the rest of this field. But we are coming up on halfway indeed. Yes, halfway, uh, probably a good subject to move on to. And the fact that the outside lane's got five cars working in its favor now looks like it's led on the outside by Seth DeMerchant has made a nice resurgence. We talked about that last uh, before the last round of green flag stops. He and Christian Peterson were mired way back in the mid-20s. Seth DeMerchant. A great round of pit stops for him has vaulted him forward now with the first car on the outside lane uh, there with help from behind from Jimmy Mullis. I see the 24 of Bowden and of course Steve Sheehan on the outside there. So four cars fighting against uh, about eight or so. I'll call it six cars on the inside lane uh, within the top ten. So almost an even split top to bottom there. Of course Keister still out front. Oh, look at the move made up by Nick Ottinger to go to the high side right in front of Colin Bowden. I didn't think he had the, the room to make that move happen, but he did it nonetheless. So Ottinger on the high side trying to work with Jimmy Mullis. The problem there for Ottinger, as you see Michael Conti slide up there, pulls it for this race. So the front row drivers now working together on the high side. But, uh, and actually, a, a lot of eye rating and a lot of peak man is up there. And a little bit of podium in sports elite series in there as well. So as I see Jimmy Mullis in the number 46 machine working that high lane, and now all of them have come together. And with all that experience, they have drawn just about dead even with the eight machine of Colin Keister for the race lead. And we're seeing now, it, we're still halfway, <laughs> not even halfway, and these guys are starting to get a little more aggressive now with their moves. Uh, I don't know what has changed for these drivers, but they want to be leading. They want to be up towards the front now, and they're really tired of waiting around and making some way more aggressive moves than we saw early on in this race. So uh, we're... we're Again, three laps from halfway, and uh, intensity just ramped up here with these drivers. Ramped up a lot with drivers here. I wonder, uh, we have no halfway bonus or anything, so it's more of a matter of pride to say that you're leading at halfway. But uh, that last time around, Seth Diversion actually was scored as the leader, so he'll get uh, at least one lap led here in the podium of Sports States on a 500. But Keister now back in control of this race. And I think very interestingly enough, Graham Bowen, we talk about cars sort of mixing in a lap down. Bowen currently scored here in the 33rd position. He is the first car one lap down. So if we do have a yellow, that would be the man who, so long as he's not part of the incident, would stand to get the free pass and get back on the lead lap. That's a good place to be, is back on the lead lap. And that's why you fight so hard to be in that position. 
you just never know when the stroke of luck can go your way. And it could break out at any time, so you just got to make sure you put yourself in the right position to benefit if it does happen to break out. And again, these guys have done a great job through the first 98, now 99 laps up on the board here as they start that 99th lap of staying off each other. I've seen a few bold moves. We did have that one little minor dust up that didn't trigger a yellow flag as well, but by and large, these guys doing a great job. And look at this outside lane. It is working. Michael Conti, Ashton Crowder, Nick Ottinger on the high side there. Three cars in a row trying to suck up to the back of Jimmy Mullis and Seth the Merchant. If these guys can get together the five up top, I think they might be able to start rolling. I think they might be able to start rolling here now. This pack is relatively even top side and bottom, interestingly enough. So we'll uh, see how they shake out here as we get set to complete the next to last lap of the first half of this race coming to lap 100 now and when we cross the circuit the next time we'll have a whole host of information for you as we enter the second half of the party of these sports states on a 500 and a completely green flag from here just that one incident there off of turn four with both those cars ending up on the apron right away so no yellow thrown here uh, and so, uh, and other than uh, the uh, the black flag uh, earlier by uh, Cress for driving through too many pit stalls and uh, the game imploding for Malik Ray, uh, that was the only issues that we've really had so far in this race. Uh, yeah, and then uh, just a little bit of the uh, of the dust up, but we have uh, again coming down to halfway. Who's going to lead halfway? It's going to be barely. Set the merchant at the line, uh, just about uh, nose to nose. We can start this next half of this race now. Can start the next half of the race, but before we do that, it, as always here on your Pro Daily Sports Network broadcast, it's time to bring you the iRacing Midway Race Break, which is brought to you by iRacing, the world's leading online racing simulation. Developed from the beginning as a centralized racing and competition service, iRacing organizes, hosts, and officiates races on virtual tracks all around the world. iRacing is home to a wide variety of officially sanctioned series, with racing from the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship, the Cars Tour, right here on the Podium Esports Network on Wednesday nights, IndyCar, IMSA, NASCAR, the World of Outlaws, and more. And I will also throw in a special note off the back of the announcement yesterday on Twitter. I hope everyone else is as excited as I am to see the circuit to Catalonia join iRacing later on in the future. Big announcement that came out yesterday, so congrats to the team at iRacing for putting that one together. I know a lot of people wanted to see that for a bit, but in the meantime, we'll take a look at the rundown as it stands and your full field rundown looks like this. Colin Keister is your race leader. Seth Demerchik currently scored in second. Third is the 21 of John Gorlinski. Fourth will be Jimmy Lomas in the 46. Dylan Jones has currently scored fifth. Six is where you'll find the 88 of Michael Conti. Colin Bowden currently scored in the seventh spot. Eight for the 77 of Ashton Crowder. Steve Sheehan ninth. And then Nick Ottinger in the 47 for JTG Doherty. Currently runs in the tenth spot. I mean, Andrew Fainar is in the 11th position. Nick Morris in 12th. Tyler Dalton 13th. Andrew Fayash in 14th. Justin Levine 15th. Femi Olat in 16th. Justin Knobloch 17th. Raul Alves 18th. Brad Neer 19th. And Christian Peterson rounds out the top 20. Will Cooley will come in 21st. Derek Justice in 22nd position as we speak. Adam Biddefield has fallen all the way back to 23rd right now. Justin Bolin in 24th. Brandon Holder in the 25th spot. Gary Sexton Jr. in 26th. Kyle Brummett in the 27th spot. Brad LaPrade, uh, Briar LaPrade in the 28th spot. Josh Bonwell in 29th. And Chris Shearbird in 30th. 31st is where you'll find the number 10 of Daniel Falkingham. 32nd, the 69 of Matt Cucker. Last car on the lead lap. 33rd is the 41 of Graham Boland, who's currently up here in this lead pack. 34th is the 30 of Logan Crest, still trying to fight his way back from that pit stop penalty. Chris Simon on the 39 currently sits in the 35th spot. 36 is the 33 of Kevin McCullough Jr. 37 is the 03 of Chris Canfield. 38 is the 16 of Aaron McAkron. Donald Sklenka currently scored in 39th. 40th is Donald Powers. Malik Ray currently scored 41st after the connection issue, still running on the track. And then Ryan Hill and Tyler Young wrecked in turn four about 20 laps ago. They are currently scored 42nd and 43rd on the board. And that is our part of the Midway Race Break. But before we wrap it up, let's turn it to Sissio Scaramuza to tell us what's been happening in chat and let us know about all the information you need to hear from from Podium Esports. Hey guys, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, just one subscription came in during that break there. Sim Ricky came in with the 499, so a tier one sub there for him. Thank you very much for supporting the stream. Apart from that, a couple of the big 
you know, notes that we've seen, comments asking about what happened to Ray, uh, Malik Ray running into issues, his sim going down while he was streaming, and you can uh, check over on his stream over at uh, Campaign Ray to see what, precisely what happened, but either way, that's basically put Malik Ray at, uh, at the back of the field here, so unfortunate for him, screen went black, sim went down, no sound, it was, uh, it was an entire mess, and unfortunately for him, that, uh, that's probably gonna take him out of the running here for uh, the Daytona 500. He still will get a little piece of the purse here because everybody does who qualified in. So, unfortunately for Ray, not as much as he was hoping to expect. But before we th send things uh, back up to the booth here, one quick thing that we do want to show you, a little bit of a tease here, here. There's more on the way here from Podium Esports. And with that, a lot of tease. We're going to have a lot of fun here, as James Pike had talked about earlier. What happens once the uh, seasons wrap up here in July? Oh, we got big, big plans. Don't you worry. So July 2019, coming July 2019. Yeah, maybe that should be the hashtag, JD. But nonetheless, uh, definitely looking forward to that. One last thing, one very, uh, one small note before we do go. Hey, you want a little bit of merch here? Why don't you head over to uh, PodiumEsports.com slash store where it's a 20% off sale on hats and shirts today only during the uh, during the Daytona 500. But with that, we'll send things back up to the booth with James Pike, James Kerhula, David Shieldhouse, and John Theodore. Gentlemen. And that will wrap up to today's iRacing Midway race break with over 80,000 drivers on the service and over 80 laser scan tracks and cars to choose from, or tracks and cars to choose from, and I guess 81, I suppose, if you want to chuck in the second to Catalonia that will be forthcoming. iRacing is the original eSports racing game. And for more information on iRacing, you can visit iRacing.com today. We have cleared a halfway, and I think, to be fair, uh, we're going to take a little short commercial break here and get everything set up for the second half of the Daytona 500 here from Podium Esports. So thank you all for watching. We'll be right back after the other side of this commercial break with more action from the World Center of Racing. You're watching coverage of the Podium Esports Daytona 500 live here on the Podium Esports Network. I'm just going to do picture in picture. You're just going to go follow it. Yep, go ahead. For nearly 65 years, the Porsche Club of America has offered an unparalleled experience to Porsche owners across North America. Now, PCA is proud to offer a new experience to the 130,000 members of the largest single mark car club in the world. Introducing the Porsche Club of America Sim Racing Series in partnership with iRacing and Podium Esports. 60 PCA members will compete for victory with the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car on eight iconic North American circuits. All 
Broadcast live on the iRacing Esports Network. All of you who believe that sim racing can be bigger. We're down to it. What should be one last restart. For all of you who believe sim racing can be better. Five laps to go when they cross the stripe. Your moment. Here they come. Back to the trial one of the start finish line. Is now. He gets bumped up. He gets shoved out of the way. Here he comes. They make contact. Up at the line. I can't tell who's going to get it. Introducing Podium Esports, your new home for the best competition in sim racing. The outside, they go side to side. They come down to the start finish line. Featuring the Podium Esports Elite Series. The Podium Esports Truck Series. And much, much more. We get the green flag two laps to go here at Daytona. All broadcast live on the Podium Esports Network. What a run! More racing, bigger purses, and the best competition. Welcome to Podium Esports, launching January 2nd. Welcome back to coverage of the Podium Esports Daytona 500 here on the Podium Esports Network. And uh, for those of you who might be curious, I know we had the ad run during the commercial break. For those of you who are asking what PCA is, that would be the Porsche Club of America. And the Porsche Club of America has partnered with Podium Esports to bring us the Podium Esports and Porsche Club of America Sim Racing Series, which will kick off March 1st. You can head to, I believe it's PCASimRacing.com, if my memory serves me correctly for the URL, in order to find out more information on that. But we are going to go road racing in the spring with them. I will note that you need to be a member of the PCA in order to be eligible to register for that series. But for PCA members, we're, we're going to find out a lot about who the best driver is on a road course. And for the first time in a while here with Pro Debris Sports versus David Showhouse, we're going to turn right and we're going to run sports cars. What's that all about? Well, for those that tuned in a few weeks ago, you got to see some rally cross, something a little bit different there. So it's not going to just be ovals going fast, turning left. We've been on dirt. And why not hit some of the best road course circuits in the country as well to go run at for those Porsches? Uh, left and right works. And I'm a sucker for good road course racing as well as a different kind of race craft. I'll be excited to see it right here on the Podium Esports Network. That series, I believe, is going to kick off March 1st. It's actually going to be broadcast on the iRacing Esports Network instead of here at our normal home. So uh, you can see it there. You can see it also on all of the PCA's regular social media channels. And uh, we're very excited to be able to work with the Porsche Club of America to bring you some of the best Porsche competition in sim racing as well. So. Getting back to it here, we'll bring you to actually take that back. Before we bring you back to all the magic here, we'll take a moment to remind you that today's broadcast of the Podium Esports State Total 500 is brought to you uh, by Lefty Productions. Lefty Productions is a company that specializes in producing marketing and advertising videos. They have experience with aerial drone video and photography, motion video graphics, training videos, and much, much more. Lefty Productions is also proud to be the producer of all videos for Podium Esports. And for more information on them, you can visit www.leftypro.com. Also, we'll remind you that if your brand of business is interested in advertising or partnering with Podium Esports, we have space available for you. Podium Esports is a plan for every budget and can custom tailor solutions to suit your business or brand's needs best. For more information on the wide variety of advertising and partnership possibilities, send an email to admin at podiumesports.com. 
And my last friendly reminder here as we wrap up all the halfway madness. Uh, if you're interested, stick around here. We're going to come back to racing in the not too distant future after the Daytona 500 wraps up tonight, right here at twitch.tv forward slash Podium Esports on the Podium Esports Network. We'll have the Podium Esports Truck Series in their regularly scheduled slot racing from New Smyrna Speedway. We'll go short tracking just a little bit inland here in Florida from Daytona. So a celebration of Speed Weeks and the World Series of Asphalt Stock Car Racing all rolled into one. And we'll get the green flag for that coverage at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on the Podium Esports Network. So, let's get ready to get back to action here. I, I think I want to turn to John Theodore. He's made a lot of points to us here in our little internal comm section. And, John, uh, just talk a little bit about that high side and the group of drivers that seems to be working up there. What have you seen and observed and noted here from all the action in the first half of this race? A couple things that I've noticed is that it seems like no matter what happens, whether it's starting in 30, 35th place or... You know, up pit road happened right now. It's I've just noticed that number eight car always seems to find the front. It does not matter where they are. He he seems to find his way back to the front. Um, twenty four of uh, Bowden. Bowden has uh, been doing a great job of pretty eager to go to the top side and try to make something happen. Uh, no matter what, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over back to you guys. We got as we're, one in the grass. 56, 56, 56, 56. Josh Bonwell nearly had a little incident on pit road as we get set for all sorts of pit action. We see everybody coming in for pit stops once more. Yeah, yeah we see the replay. Uh, Bonwell way too hot into the entry here and uh, just goes right. I don't know if he was trying to abort mission or what he was doing, but uh, luckily he didn't hit anybody else. That was a, a strange incident. He'll get away with it for the most part. Not sure if he'll get a penalty for getting out into the grass, though. He may, he may not. We'll see how things shake out here as everybody sources themselves out. Jimmy Mullis and a lot of these peak drivers here. Michael Conti set the march at this last group to come down the pit road. Yeah, and so there's the last group coming down on the pit road now. Let's see if anyone has any issues getting on the pit road. A lot of really good uh, hard on the brakes there by Tyler Dalton made up a little bit of time coming down the pit road. Nice and clean for these guys. Remember, these guys were the ones that stayed out the longest on the last pit stop, and they gained a lot of time by doing so. Let's see where they come out on this pit stop. See how things shake out on the pit stop. Jimmy Mullis brings it in pretty good. Oh, Mullis overshot his pit. Mullis overshot his pit ever so slightly. I don't think that's going to cost him too much, but definitely something to note here. Mullis will come out behind most of this group. Again, you got to be perfect on and off of pit road. These are the self-induced errors that guys just can't afford to have. We look at Mullis get down and away. He's going to have Demerchant. He's going to have Ottinger. And he's going to have help ahead from Michael Conti as well. So uh, that little bit of a, a mistake, a little sliding past the uh, pit sign, isn't going to hurt Jimmy Mullis. He's going to have the drafting help, so he'll get away with one there as well. So, again, they got to clean these things up with uh, potentially one more pit stop looming under green flag conditions before this thing's all said and done. Uh, they're going to have to tighten things up. You can't have those mistakes, especially in the closing laps. Especially in the closing laps where you absolutely don't have any room to make mistakes here. And, oh, Jimmy Mullis was very, very close, but he managed to escape madness. And so now we'll see how things shake out once they come across the start-finish line once more. As you see John Gorlinski and Dylan Jones up in the 11 machine make the move around the outside of this group. I also see Colin Keister and Colin Bowden up there as well. Yep, and we see uh, Graham Ballin and Ashton Crowder both get black flags for driving through too many pit stalls on the exit of that last pit stop. Uh, you have to get in and out. You have to get out of those pit stalls here very quickly. And so uh, we see those two having to come in and uh, coming out now after serving their penalties. Uh, but that's going to put them in a very bad spot. Uh, and we saw that group that stayed out later again. They're coming out, and they came out well within the top five now. Uh, John Gorlinski and that 11 of Dylan Jones were able to get uh, out there quickly and uh, take the lead. But a lot of uh, a lot of gains in position for that group that stayed out later. And let's see if that pays off for them uh, later on in the race. Remember, if they're uh, thinking that this is going to go green to the end, they can take less fuel on that last pit stop and then uh, save another second or two. Potentially save another second or two. It doesn't necessarily always work out that way, but it's definitely something that you need to keep track of here. As John Gorlinski now settles into the lead of this race. Again, a good push from behind from Dylan Jones. Look at this scramble behind with Keister and Ottinger going at it there. Under forcing his way underneath the eight. Didn't leave him a lot of room as they'll work past the Sunoco machine of Malik Ray. 
So to put them about three wide down the back straight. Getting a good push from behind is Nick Ottinger from Andrew Fash. So Keister left up on the outside now by himself. He might fall back uh, behind Fash. He might lose even more spots as here comes TD. Tyler Dalton uh, behind Fash. He's bringing Fainars with him. The Merchant, Morse as well. So Colin Keister from the front going to be shipped back maybe as far as uh, 12th or so. 12th, 14th potentially. Also a note, look who's at the very back of this pack and I think is going to let Keister in maybe wisely. How about it? The number four, Malik Ray, who suffered the connection issues earlier on, so he's well deep on the pylon here. Currently scored 41st, seven laps down, but Malik Ray is there, but here's the bigger story. Now Keister, I think, is beginning to lose that lead back just a bit, so Malik Ray is going out to push hard here and it makes me wonder if these drivers in this lead pack have seen the speed that Colin Keister has had up until the this point in this race and if they may be trying to all work together to dump him out of the lead group as to minimize the threat that he may offer to the rest of them in terms of keeping them out of victory lane at the end of the day yeah well we've seen these drivers if uh, you're not playing nice with them they will make sure that you are not put in a good spot and i think that those drivers uh were not too happy with the uh, the aggression there of colin Kess uh, keister and i think that they forced him out there now Keep in mind that uh, Malik Ray is back there seven laps down because of electrical issues, not because of damage uh, to his car or to a wreck. And if someone knows how to push the car back up there, uh, I would definitely be very happy to have Malik Ray behind me. So uh, Colin Keister is now getting a very good run here and a very good push by uh, Malik Ray. And I think he is still going to be able to hang on to the back of this pack here. He should. A big, big push there from a late race. So Colin Keister uh, was in trouble for a little bit there, but got a little second leash on life. And now Keister will be back up here towards the back of this. And all of a sudden goes to the outside and nearly makes contact with the three of Nick Morse. Morse tried to jump up in front of him, but couldn't quite get up there fast enough. So, and now, oh, well, there's paper. Well, I can't tell what they're trying to do here. Morse very clearly wants to be in front of Keister. Keister very clearly wants to be alongside Morse. So pick your poison, I suppose. Uh, I tell you where Colin Keister wants to be. He wants to be back out in front where he was before this cycle of green flag stops. And he's probably telling his uh, buddy there, Malik Ray, push me, push me, push me. We can make it happen. Look at the eight surge down the straightaway there. Uh, something to keep an eye on is when that little scrap occurred, as uh, John pointed out to me, and I went back and looked at it as well, the little dust up between Keister and Nick Ottinger. It appeared that 47 did go below the double yellow line unnecessarily. So I'm not sure if the... Uh, staff are reviewing that for a potential illegal overtake underneath the yellow line or not, but uh, something to keep an eye on there that might just be let go as part of a racing deal or hard racing, whatever it may be, but something potential lurking there for Nick Ottinger got very close to flirting with a pass below the double yellow line. We'll see if race control makes any sort of ruling on that. I haven't heard any rumblings from race control yet, so uh, we'll wait and see how that shapes out. But in the meantime, Ottinger currently hanging around in the sixth spot in that number 47 Kroger Chevy Camaro for JTT Jordy Racing. One of the drivers drafted in the Peak Series draft about a week and a half ago, and we'll see him in action on Tuesday night right here for the World Center Racing as well. So now we see Colin Kester. He did get caught back up there, and he's got his new best friend, Malik Ray, behind him and giving him a nice push there on that outside line and is going to work his way back up here and then see uh, how far they could, uh, they could get back up there. Remember, Malik is probably not too content on giving up the ghost just yet, even though he's seven laps down. If he could get uh, back there, I'm sure he would like to get as many of those laps back as he is able to, uh, and he will be just fine pushing that number eight car right now. And we'll see what happens when uh, that eight car gets up there next to that 47 uh, after that scrap that they had just a few laps ago. So we'll look to see how things shake out and we'll wait here to see what happens with Colin Bowden and company and Malik Ray who's still hung out on the top side. The 46 and Jimmy Mullis in there as well. A lot of power and speed in this group. Definitely, and Keister is falling back. He's getting a good push from behind from Tyler Dalton, but he's got to get a better push to suck up to the back of the seven of Andrew Fayash as uh, Keister ditched his buddy Ray and now needs to get some more push and going as they go by the 10 of Daniel Falkingham, not having the race he was hoping to have. Falkingham back in 29th, one lap down. This lead group getting formed up once again and Keister, I, you know, he's a very aggressive driver. Anyone who spent any time on the sim with him will, uh, will attest to that and uh, sometimes that aggression can be good for you as he's gonna try and work his way back up to the field currently in the eighth spot in that number eight. Gonna have to show a little bit of patience, still a long way to go. I know 70 laps to go this time by. Doesn't sound like very much, but a lot can change between now 
and the checkered flag for Colin Keister. He liked being up front. He can get back up there. He's going to have to survive a few more laps. Be patient and get some good help. If he's patient, he will get some good help. And I know Keister definitely will want to get back up. I think his sort of running partner for all of this is going to be the 24 machine of Colin Bowden and the DuPont Rainbow Warriors colors up there. That's Chevy Camaro and the aid of Colin Keister. The Bass Pro Shops machine have worked together a lot today. And I think that's who Keister is trying to work back up towards here. Had a little bit of help earlier from Malik Ray to get back up into the middle of this pack. But Keister and Bowden definitely enjoy working together, have worked well together, have run well together in this race. I would be very surprised if they did not connect together at least one more time before we see the end of this race. Now, a group that I am very interested in, and I think that uh, they've been working very well together uh, since about the second pit stop, and that's going to be the number seven of Andrew Fayash, uh, Tyler Dalton in the 19, and then uh, double zero of Andrew Fainarge. Those guys have been on a different pit strategy and trying to extend their pit stops just a little bit more and we see them every single time that they've gained about a couple more spots. Uh, they have been spot on with their pit stops. And I think that that's going to come down in the play here late in this race. Again, less fuel, less time on pit road. And again, if they could keep nailing off those pit stops the way that they have, I believe that we're going to see those guys really contending for this victory. As we see Colin Bowden and Nick Ottinger look to the outside, don't necessarily really make anything of it though and now looks like Bowden's sort of stuck there on the outside but I wonder if he may be dropping back to Colin Keister in the number eight machine so I'll watch and see where he goes and as we wait to see how that shakes out how about we bring John Theodore back in and John just uh, general observations from the last 20 laps this is sort of a weird place in the race where you're you're not close enough to the end of where you really want to go for it but you're certainly beginning to think about how you want to run the last parts of this race what have you seen from your spot here over looking Daytona International Speedway. Well, the way that it's been playing out, it really this race really has had that green flag look to it. And so the most important thing right now is to make sure that if you're in that front pack, you want to stay there. And if you're not in that front pack, you want to organize, try to organize enough guys to try to draft up there. Um, but if we don't get a caution to bunch this field up, I really don't think that the winner is going to be someone not currently in this front group of cars that we've been watching for uh, the majority of this race. And so, you know, the biggest thing is, um, obviously, you want to be at the front of that pack because what we've seen all day is it is almost impossible to pass that lead car. I think I've seen two drivers, the uh, 47 of Ottinger and the 8 of Keister, be able to actually complete a pass on the outside and get back down in front uh, all race long. So that that... What, what I'm looking at as we approach um, the final pit stop of this race is who's going to be able to get down pit road, make, the, make that pass, get their stop done as quickly as possible, and then emerge from pit road in the front. That's very likely going to be who you're going to see win the Daytona 500. Very likely, you would think. And then you stop and you think about it and realize that if we get one yellow flag, Mr. David Schillenhaus, that will change the entire complexion of this race and bring pretty much everybody back into it. Because if you look at this lead pack right now, I think we're currently sitting on maybe about, oh, what, 13, 14 cars, if you count Malik Ray and the 41 of Graham Bullen in there, even though they're lapped down. But if we get a yellow flag, we are going to have potentially 30 cars bunched together on the lead lap. And, 30 cars tends to be a little bit crazier than the handful that we have, or two handfuls perhaps, that we have in the front currently. Looking at the timing of scoring, I see right now 24 cars scored on the lead lap. Ashton Crowder in the 77 being the last of those drivers. He's in the pack right now, uh, way off of the lead, some uh, 39 seconds behind the leader. Um, so, yeah, 12 car lead pack, those couple of lap down vehicles, Bolin and Ray. Uh, trying to hold on as best they can to those 12 cars in front of them. I'm not sure they're going to be able to. Uh, they might be able to suck back up, and that would increase the pack to 14. But once again, think about uh, maybe oh, guys like Nick Morris, Seth the Merchant, Andrew Fainar are just hanging out in the back of that lead pack, showing a lot of patience, knowing they have plenty of time to make the moves. they got some cars behind them to help propel them, but nobody really seems too intent on making a move at this point. Again, just sort of in put it in cruise control mode and ride it out until the next stop, which uh, might be the last stop of the day, depending on how they cycle through. About 16 laps since the last time these guys were on pit road, somewhere around there. So yeah, it might be the last stop if they stretch it uh, just enough to make up the 200-lap distance. 
Um, looking through, it's probably going to be two more stops from here now that I think about that, doing the math in my head. But nonetheless, John Gorlinski out in front leading the entire thing. And we talked about the path that he had to the Daytona 500, sort of an inauspicious start to his qualifying race. Touched off an incident on the very first lap right before they even got to the start-finish line, uh, but worked his way through that qualifying race and finished very strongly uh, well inside of the top eight to transfer into the duels and had himself a very high-quality Daytona duel last night as well. So now out front in this field getting shades of oh, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there, or the name like John Gorlinski leading the field here in iRacing. Your pole sitters here were Michael Johnson, or Michael Johnson was the pole sitter with a 47.761. John Gorlinski ran a 48.180 in qualifying and just buried himself in the back of qualifiers yesterday, but he raced his way through all of it to get himself into the big show. And now John Gorlinski in that number 21, just that neon colored Chevy Camaro, no sponsors on that car, but he currently leads the field here in the inaugural podium Esports States on a 500. So pretty impressive run for the number 21 machine. Absolutely. David, I agree with you. This is very nostalgic seeing that 21 up front. John Gorlinski, a man that's been around the service for a long time. Everyone remembers the NASCAR race in 2003 days, but uh, this has been a, uh, a fantastic race, and I've been loving how this has been, uh, this has been playing out here over the last uh, few laps. Uh, that top five, they were really starting to work together, and they were maybe about to break away. Uh, but uh, they got side by side again, and that allowed that top 10 to get caught back up there. Uh, we almost saw that uh, lead group get broken down into 10. But uh, if you guys see, it's uh, it's quite shady out here right now. We're getting later in the day. Uh, the track tip is now down to 85, so uh, more grip as we see throughout here. Those shadows are getting really long in uh, 1 and 2. And, of course, we got a cloud overhead as we head down the back stretch and into turns 3 and 4 as well. So uh, we're getting closer uh, to the end of the day and we'll uh, again that outside line if it is uh, as impressive as these guys have been making that outside line work here early on in this event just wait till we get a little more grip here uh, later on waiting here because I, I hear the pitter patter of webbed feet as everybody shorts themselves out here on the front straight here we're going to wait and see how this all pans out but uh, we can tell you that a certain feathered friend is inbound momentarily for his usual appearance here on all podium esports network broadcast this time with a very special daytona 500 theme piece of information for you all to sleuth out i can't wait to hear what it is probably something daytona related if i had to guess we'll find out soon enough but again I mean, there haven't been many drivers that have been this uh comfortable riding in the outside lane than Callum bowden uh, he's really been up there a lot more often than not that uh, rainbow machine has been up on the high side getting a push from the two lapped vehicles of uh, bolin and ray so you know friends come in interesting forms they say around daytona for sure maybe not the help he was expecting to get but help he will take nonetheless but just 100 percent outmatched by the number of cars on the inside lane right now as they work lap 142 down the back straightaway Bowden doing everything he can. you got to give him a lot of respect for staying up there and trying to make that high side work. You talked about the, the sun starting to set and all that. I look out at the track, and perhaps John can speak to this a little bit more himself and his experience. You see two distinct grooves and a, a patch of gray between the rubber there in the corners as this track continues to take on rubber. It only makes that high side more viable. How much does that really help here at Daytona? How much does that help? We'll find out a little bit later because... David Schildhouse, this is always your honor, and you get to do it here on the biggest stage at Podium Esports. It is time for you to call on a certain feathered friend of yours. All right, I guess it's time to do it, so let's do it for the Daytona 500. Cue the Chuck. As Chuck the Chuck comes across your screens here to present today's Podium Esports Daytona 500 trivia question. So... Let's go to the rules very quickly here. We do have either iRacing credits or an Amazon gift card online here for the winner. As I see Chad just completely explode of the trivia question. But we do have rules here, and there are three to note. 
First, employees and contractors of Podium Esports LLC are not eligible. Second, only the first response in chat will be counted. Any other responses that you put in chat will be ineligible for the competition. And more importantly, we are going to try and delete all of them as best we can. Don't completely bombard us. But we do have a few pieces of information here to make sure that you have to think a little bit about your answer. And so today's trivia question is as follows. Two drivers have won the clash, the pole for the Daytona 500 and the Daytona 500 itself within the same speed weeks. Can you name the drivers and the years in which they accomplished the feats? We need both drivers and both years, not necessarily tied together in the same order, but if you can punch the answer in chat, we will hand away a Amazon gift card or numbers here. Uh, as I, I see a few bits and pieces coming through, still waiting years. We need years and drivers. Years and drivers, not just drivers. So uh, I see a lot of uh, incorrect answers really coming in here. A lot of people starting to piece together the right stuff. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I have a feeling they probably mentioned it during the clash as well. So... Uh, as we wait to see how things sort of pop up here. Nobody really coming yet, but we'll keep track of that. And, uh, we'll see. Yes, uh, David Schildhouse, if you want to put it in that format, we'll note it here. So um, I, I, I will confess I've seen one correct driver and year pop up. We're still waiting for the other. I haven't seen the second answer come in correctly. I'll let, uh, let the eyes... Keep an eye out there. Hopefully, Maximum Lions on his game. He's got the uh, got the peepers out looking at what's happening in chat. But yeah, you got to get both names and the years in the same reply. So keep that in mind too. One reply per person, both drivers, both years in the same reply. And then you can be deemed a winner here in trivia. Haven't seen it yet. Haven't seen it yet. That's a very very big piece here. As we wait for the answer to pop up in. Very, very close. Very close here as everybody just sort of popping around here and waiting for things to happen. I, I still don't see. Ah. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, we were so close. There it so is. So close. There, there it, it is. is. We've got it. We've got it. Solar 424 comes away with the answer. And the correct answer was indeed Dale Jarrett in 2000 and Bill Elliott in 1987. So congratulations to shoulder and thanks to all of you for playing along with Chuck Knock and in today's very special theme that Putty Me Sports and Tate's on the 500 trivia question. So now can we get back to the question I wanted to ask to John Theodore now that we're done with Chuck? All right, fine, go ahead. <laughs> I really want the answer to that and I, I, I feel bad that I overlapped our good friend Chuck because uh, I knew he wanted to come in and, and make his presence known but John I, I really am curious from your perspective uh, as you see the the grooves developing here at Daytona, uh, how much does that? How much do you feel of that from the driver's seat, and, and how can that help the outside lane? The biggest thing that I did notice, um, especially yesterday uh, during the qualifying race, when we went longer. Um, actually, both races at the end of the run, when the, when the tires start to get worn out, as my dog. I don't know if you guys can hear that, <laughs> but. Uh, what, he's what happens chasing after Chuck. Is that the. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. The, 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 the tires start to wear a little bit, and you'll just notice that entering the corner, the car's going to want to wash up and drift up. As uh, Colin Keister goes to the uh, lead right now. So what that does is... Uh, <laughs> hey, can you need to settle down and let me talk, man? <laughs> um, it just makes it harder for the bottom line to really keep the foot to the floor. And that a lot that that means that because the, the outside line is able to go full throttle, those checkups on the bottom are what allow the outside line to get that extra push. I I, I, I appreciate chat. I think we might let John have a moment here to feed the dog. I also add in one more quick note here before we get really back towards the last bit of racing here. So a lot of guesses of Bobby Allison in 1982, and Bobby did win the 500 and the Clash that year, but he did not win the pole. Benny Parsons was the pole sitter for the Daytona 500 that year. So close but no cigar to those folks, and a big congratulations to Solar for getting the two men who have had probably, arguably, the most dominant speed weeks of anyone because both of them, incidentally enough, as I was looking 
Looking up the trivia question, also finished second in their respective qualifying races the Thursday of Speed Week. So, average finish of you know one, one, two, one, almost as good as Tony Stewart's run to win the 2011 championship, in which I think with the final four races of that season, his average finish was a 1.5, about as good as you can have it at Daytona. Here we go as we are coming down. Again, last pit stop is coming up here in about nine laps. Uh, these guys, we see the 41 of uh, uh, Cress and then Malik Ray. Oh, no, it's a 41. I'm sorry. That is uh, Graham Ballin. Uh, those guys are lap down right now. Ray, uh, seven laps down right now. They're trying to uh, push their way back up and uh, at least get uh, a Ballin back onto the, uh, the lead lap there. But coming down, these guys, uh, with the last pit stop, this is going to be very key to get yourself into a good position here. You need to be down there on that bottom line right now to make sure that you have a good entry to pit road. And this is going to be by far the most important one. If you're in that top group right now, again, we have 12 cars that are in that lead group. This, If you're in that top group, you have a chance to win this race. Now, the ones that I think is going to be very important to watch on this last pit stop, let's go back to the number 7, the number 19, and the number, uh, the number 00. Uh, Fayash, Dalton, and Feynard have been working very well with each other on these pit stops. Uh, they have slowly worked their way up over the last few and have been uh, mid-pack to uh, right outside the top 10 to right inside the top 10 to even inside the top 5 every single pit stop. They've been staying out a little bit later. I think that those are your three that you need to be watching here on this final pit stop. Also, just looking here at some of the names that have been around in the back and have sort of survived everything to make it up here, who don't necessarily have teammates or alliances or anything. I look very particularly at that number three machine of Nick Morse, the Peak Appliance Ford Fusion, who we talked to right at the top of the broadcast, has been right around towards the back of the top ten, but here we are, almost three-quarters of the way in. And he's already in good shape here to make it out of here. Raul Almas for High Performance Motorsports. His teammate to uh, you know, the three machine is currently scored an 18th and is in one of the other packs in this field. Also, look at Andrew Fayos and Tyler Dalton in there as two drivers who were put in Esports Elite Series Gold Division regulars who don't really have any alliances up here per se, but are currently in the top group. And then Andrew Farina for Rio Sun Racing. One who's been around that series for a long while. Farina has uh, managed to sneak his way towards the very back of this group and hang on out here into this league of drivers. But uh, also, I, I suppose, want to keep note of the fact that Malik Ray and Graham Boland are both up here as well. We talked about it earlier. Jimmy Willis and Malik Ray are now teammates of Richmond Raceway Esports. So if Mullis is in the hunt here at the end of this race, I would not be surprised to see the four try and push him to victory. It's good to have new teammates on top of your old ones that you work together well with. And, yeah, that's an interesting uh, pairing to think about of how that duo could work together here in the closing laps. Now we're past the three-quarters mark distance. Uh, this is when business starts to pick up. This is when you really got to start thinking about how you're going to get onto pit road for your last uh, green flag stop of the day and how you're going to formulate the strategy that's going to be required to put yourself up front when that checkered flag flies right now, John Gorlinski, Colin Keister, the two guys up front doing it right now as Keister continues to lead that outside lane, getting a great push uh, from the 24 of Bowden. But again, that inside lane has been so strong, but as the laps go on, we see, as John said, that top lane can come into effect as guys on the bottom have to lift and check up. The top lane can stay flat-footed, and that gives them the advantage. So now as we see a good side-by-side -side battle for the first four rows, all the way back to Malik Ray. Those two lap cars continue to play an interesting role in this lead pack. I have a feeling they'll throw a wrinkle into this. And a big thank you to Dos Excel for subscribing with Switch Prime the second month of row. And to answer the question, and no, this is not what's left of the field. We just have not had too many yellows yet. Knock, knock, knock. I haven't had any. Uh, yeah, I haven't really had too many to deal with. So, uh, you know, we're still, we're still waiting to see what happens, but... Uh, we just had a lot of pit stop cycles break this field up. We currently have 29 cars on the lead lap. So uh, as you also see the stint numbers here for these drivers, how long it's been since they've been on pit road, and we are creeping up to that 40-lap marker, which means we should see some pit stops here in the next handful of laps. Yeah, and as we were just talking a few laps ago, uh, the three that I said to look out for, well, they've kind of exploded off the back of the pack right now. Uh, at least uh, uh, Faye Ash and uh, Tyler Dalton are at least up there in there, uh, but uh, Feynarge has uh, fallen off the back, and if they don't go back there and get them, uh, they've been, 
he's been very important to those uh, two so far. Uh, let's see if they're able to get around that number 47 and Nick Ottinger. Right now, they're uh, probably putting themselves in a position that they're going to wind up losing this race, trying to get around that 47 car uh, and losing this lead draft. Big, big question there. That's something that you got to have to worry about here. And big, big trouble now, I think, for all three of them. Free Orange is all out on his own on an island. I, I feel terrible. We just talked about him hanging on the rear end of this pack here. And then the 19 of Tyler Dalton and the 7 of Andrew Fayas are trying to stick together. But the three of them just sort of hanging on as Ottinger gets back in line. So you have a three-car train there. But they have definitely lost this lead group. They definitely have lost the lead group off the back bumper of Nick Morse in eighth. So Fayash, Dalton, Ottinger got to work hard together to push back up and get there. I think they're going to be able to do that because that lead pack is side by side for the first four rows. Oh, right. there we go. Big shovel. Jordan Gorlinski, Colin Keister up into the wall. And the first yellow flag comes out here at Daytona. And that will change strategy dramatically here as Colin Keister, one of the favorites, the fastest man in open qualifying, is a casualty here of racing at Daytona. And we have our first yellow Yellow flag of the afternoon. Yeah, and as you're going to see here, uh, we get a little bit of a bump. Uh, the 24 of Colin Bowden gives a bump to that number 8 of Colin Keister, and that sends him down into John Gorlinski, and then that causes a giant wreck and takes out essentially the entire top 10, the, the people that we've been talking about for the last 250 miles. Uh, we, we, we need to completely reassess who we're going to be talking about here. This race is completely different than what we were just talking about just a few minutes ago. None of your favorites are at all going to be in this battle for this win. Just looking here, Malik Ray has damage, though he was out of it. I see Colin Bowden's got some left front damage. Jimmy Moldis managed to spin and get away. He's a very, very lucky man, I would say. Andrew Fayosh, pretty in good shape. All those drivers who got caught out of the back of this pack who were losing the draft had some time to check up on this one. So they actually made it out pretty well, I think. The 41 of Graham Boland, who uh, I think gave the push to Bowden to set all of this off. Uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, it was actually no. There was a no. There was I take that back. There was a checkup beforehand, so it was yeah. Bowden pushing Keister, so those two had worked together so well, and Bowden pushed Keister into I believe that's Dylan Jones in the 11 machine who got a bump, and then Gorlinski got turned. Bowden got turned. I saw Michael Conti had a huge amount of damage, big damage to the corner of the 11 machine there. As, ah, yeah, Conti hit the wall hard as well. He's got damage too. Uh, just stuffed it up in the tire barrier more than anything else. And uh, I see Tyler Dalton with some damage as well as everybody trying to sort things out when we get down to pit road. Some of the few drivers that made it through from that lead pack, Colin Bowden, does have a little bit of damage to the left rear. Nick Morris probably in the best shape, aside from Andrew Fayash, the two in that top pack that made it out of there without any damage. So two cars to keep an eye on there, the seven and the three. Nick Morris might be in the best conditions. You see him work his way through that wreck down to the grass, gets through without any incident. He might be in the best shape here as they come off of pit road. They waited a long time to bring out the first yellow flag of this Daytona 500, but when they did, it was spectacular as Seth the Merchant will lead the field off of pit road. Jimmy Mullis second, Nick Morris in third. Nick Morris in third here. And oh, how this changes everything. And I think just trying to cap the driver's shoe escapes without too much trouble, I think. Just trying to look here at his car. Jimmy Mullis was one of the lucky ones. Nick Morris was one of the lucky ones. And there might have been one more. I think Seth Merchant was another one who snuck through this without too much trouble. Just trying to peek through everyone here. And Demerchant, yes, was clear. So those three were really the ones who escaped without any sort of damage. Nick Ottinger looks like he is a clean race car for the most part. Andrew Friedars, Andrew Fayos as well. But does that change everything? And uh, maybe not a huge surprise here to see Colin Bowden get the EOL for putting the bump on Keister that settled this off in the first place. Well, and one thing uh, that came right when we were expecting pit stops here, we're pitting on lap 160. These guys should be able to make it now to the end of the race if we don't have a green-white checkered finish. If we have a green-white checkered, then uh, these guys right now are not going to be in a good spot. If I was towards the back of this pack, uh, I would come down. I would make sure I get all my tires, four tires, try to have as much grip as I can for the end of this race and top up on fuel, see if I can make it for one green-white checkered finish. 
Because that's the thing here. If we get some yellow flags, then everyone should be in good shape to make the end. But as it stands, if we manage to go green the rest of the way, we're going to be right on the edge of the fuel window when we get to the checkered flag. And I think there'll be a few drivers that would be in trouble if we get a green-white checker. So I think you're right, Mr. Krahula. If you're right there towards the end of the lead lap group, I'm definitely coming in and topping off my race car with more fuel to make sure I'm good to go in the event that we have a green-white checker. Well, you'll notice some of these drivers like Jimmy Mullis and Nick Morris riding down on the apron right now. That will help the fuel mileage. I'm sure they're switching the gauges to shut the engine off when not needed as well, just to coast around uh, and having it in, in low gear as well, or in high gear rather, to keep the RPMs down uh, as well. Doing everything you can from the driver's seat to improve your fuel economy here under the yellow flag. Remember, uh, two caution laps is generally the equivalent of one green flag lap. And for these guys, they know they're right on the edge, but it should be okay for them to make it to the end. The green-white checker, like James Krahula said, could be a different uh, story entirely. That, uh, that extra distance, barring any other yellow flags, could be a stretch for even the best of fuel savers. We'll note here that Race Control has issued an EOL penalty to Brandon Holder for driving through too many pit stalls on the exit of pit road. So Holder going to go to the back of this line in the number five machine here and just sort of waiting out everything to get back there. But, uh, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. This is one of those cases where I think you need to breathe, take a moment, reset, come back to things here when you're ready and just realize that everything has just changed in this race. We'll take a moment to remind you while we have a moment that uh, if you're interested in racing and if you, you know, if you're very curious to see a little bit more action, then guess what? We heard that you like racing with your racing, so we got you more racing to go with your racing in the form of the Podium Esports Truck Series, which will go green tonight from New Smyrna Speedway here, and they will take the green flag at 8.30 p.m. Eastern right here on the Podium Esports Network. So when we wrap up 500 coverage, don't go too far away because we'll be right back at it here with some of the regular bread and butter fare of the Podium Esports family. And that, I think, should be very entertaining. John Theodore is going to run in that race. You can catch the number 27 truck in that and you want to stick around to see how he does and how everybody else gets along i think we should have a few other drivers in this field who will also be in the truck race as well so for the first time today how weird is that to say we made it all the way to lap 160 ish before we get the yellow flag but this is how your field will grid up for the restart which will take place on lap 163 of 200. seth the merchant will be your leader and then it'll be jimmy mullis on the outside of him in second then nick morse nick ottinger andrew freenars andrew fayash justin levine femi ola justin Nalock, and brad near your top 10 for this first restart of the afternoon how crazy is that to say David Schildhouse. I think it's a testament to the mentality and approach that all these drivers took coming into this 500 miler to go this far and it doesn't surprise me that the wreck took place up front that's where uh, these guys are really uh, pushing the limits to be up front they've been the best on pit road and earned those positions just a bump gun wrong from Colin Bowden an innocent enough move could happen to anybody but if it was going to get touched off I'm not surprised it came from there these guys now have to reset themselves for the last 36 laps to put themselves into a position to race for the checkered flag. To finish first, you first must finish, as we hear on so many real-life broadcasts, and that is absolutely no different here at the Podium Esports States Auto 500. Seth the Merchant gets them going once again on that 163 of 200. Should be about 37 laps to go, and if you're noticing, we've got 205 up on the board there. That is in the event of a green-white checker. We have the laps built in just with the way iRacing timing and scoring works to make sure that we can run that off cleanly as well. But Seth DeMerchant may well be in the best position you could be, period, in front of all of this. But here comes the challenge on the outside from Jimmy Mullis and Nick Ottinger. Yeah, and we're seeing now with our first restart of the race, we have a whole new cast of characters up at the front of this race. Uh, you know, we see Seth Merchant, Jimmy Mullis, and Nicholas Morse up there. But uh, let's uh, let's look at Justin Levine, uh, Femi Ola, Justin Knobloch, uh, Brad Near, Raul Alves, Christian Peterson. These guys have not been uh, they've been competitive all race, but just one bad pit stop and they were back in that second pack that we weren't paying attention to. And here they are. Everyone in the top 20 is without damage and has a chance to win this race coming up. So. Uh, this is just a whole new complexion that we have to worry about here. Uh, I, I think another one that we hear often is this changes everything. 
Oh, that's something that I've only been saying for what, like the past, you know, five or six minutes, <laughs> James Carvula. But John Theodore, now that we have everybody bunched back up together, how does this actually change everything from a driver's perspective? Well, it, it, it the, the biggest change is that now you, you know, pitting's done. All your opportunities, barring another caution, are done to try to make track position other than going to the high line. That high line now, I think, we're going to see people going up and doing it because that is the only way that you can go forward. And unless you're going to wave the white flag of surrender and say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and finish 15th, you better be making some moves and trying to find, pick your spot to get up there and try to move forward because if you don't do it now, these laps are going to ride down very quickly. And, um, you know, you're, you're going to find yourself sitting still in 15th place if you don't try to make something happen right now. Also a note here, I'm just sort of looking. Uh, big thanks to Dallas himself for gifting two sums to a certain John Theodore that you just heard from. And Justin Botello, who I believe has probably got his eyes on this broadcast, a regular in the Podium Esports Truck Series that we will see a little bit later on tonight right here on the Podium Esports Network. So more racing to come for you here after the Daytona 500 tonight. But uh, big, 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 big things are about to happen here as we get down to it working that 166 of 200. Currently, it's the mountain top five, top six that are all alone on that bottom lane single file. And oh, by the way, Raul Alves is there. We haven't talked about him much, but if we're keeping track of teammates, that's one you want to watch, especially if you can get hooked up with the three of Nick Morris. Those two work together for high performance motorsports. And Nick Morris and Raul Alves, if they can get together, might be in pretty good shape. We've talked already about Seth the Merchant and Christian Peterson. Peterson, if you're interested, currently running in the 15th spot. So he has a little bit of work to do to try and get up there, but certainly is not completely out of it here in the Podium Moves Sports State Tunnel 500. As you see him make the jump to the top side very conveniently to try and begin his charge to the front. He jumps in front of the 25 of Will Cooley. Again, track tip has gone down about 20 degrees since the start of this race, too. So that outside line is just going to be more and more competitive as we see uh, the colors start to change. We see that uh, nice orange Daytona sky really start to fall here on the Daytona International Speedway. So uh, we're not going to get full blown into nightfall here uh, with the lights coming on. But we are going to see a much cooler track and a lot more opportunity for these drivers. Uh, fresh tires, fresh rubber, uh, a grippy track, and then uh, a lot of money here on on the line, we're going to see a lot of drivers uh, move up there on that outside line. I wouldn't even be surprised to see if we see a third lane start to develop there on that outside line as drivers are going to try and find any way to get to that front. A third lane indeed, yes, as this track cools down, tires become grippier, you have more room to get up there, more confidence, uh, more ability to work that high side if you need it as you try and race your way towards a big chunk of the $7,500 purse and the GT Omega Racing Sim Rig that will go to the winner of this race. But at the same time, David Schoenhaus, with that great power that comes, also comes some great responsibility as we throw in our first uh, moving records of the day, I do believe. And well, you have to be very wary to make sure that you don't end up causing the big one. Thanks, Uncle Ben. Appreciate that one. Yes, you're correct. And uh, you don't want to be the cause of the big one like we saw earlier about 10 or so laps ago. And I look at that high side of Nick Ottinger in the 47 getting a great push uh, from behind. And, you know, no surprise of who it's coming from. It's his friend Andrew Fayash. Those two have been hooked up for a good portion of this race, making that high side work. And they got a lot of cars. Femi Olot's up there. Brad Neer in the 9. The 25, as you said, Will Cooley coming on. We got yeah, 56. 56 in trouble here, Josh Bonwell, and I see a few more cars caught up. The 71 machine of Donald Powers and the 39 of Chris Samard in trouble here with the second yellow flag at Daytona, and I have a feeling we have just entered the gauntlet, per se, of short green flag runs and a few yellow flying laps mixed in here. And as we take a look at the replay, I think Samard got a push there. It looks like that was the, I want to say it was the 99 of Donald Skalenka, and Skalenka tried to send Samard down to the bottom, and then Samard came up and was trying to stay off the yellow line and got into the 56 with Josh Bonwell and they went and I'm trying to see I think yeah I think Powers just tried to jump to the high side to avoid all of it and ended up wrecking and smacking the wall and those three for the most part should be done for the day at least in terms of their ability to win the 500 certainly pride and maybe a little bit more running to run for on the line but for the most part those three will be out of contention for the race victory 
and we haven't really had too many chances for these guys to really cause uh, a whole lot of problems here but again late in the race and that's just bumping gone wrong and that was really what we saw that caused the last accident as well too uh of just trying to get these drivers to uh get that person in front of you to just have a little bit more speed and get around and uh hope that you both make some progression up through the field and uh again we see uh not lined up perfectly correct and uh or a lot of cars kind of bunched up there and nowhere to go when you're shoving a person in front of you trying to make some progress and uh again we see that uh, uh that car go around and only three cars involved in that accident i thought that i was going to be a lot bigger but uh everyone did a great job avoiding them there waiting to see if anybody's bold enough especially towards the back of this pack to come down pit road and hey look at that right as i say that i see two drivers coming down one of them is the five of brandon holder who is still on the lead lap, he had that pit road penalty the last time by, so no surprise to see him topping things off towards the back of this field. The other is the 88 of Michael Conti, the pole sitter who was caught up in that big wreck with John Gorlinski and Colin Bowden and Colin Keister, who is still, I think, just trying to repair damage on that 88, but I would not expect to see Conti in the mix for the race victory. Now, a challenge for the victory seems out of the cards now for Michael Conti, considering the damage that he sustained after his ride into the tire barrier. In our first yellow flag session, this caution flag period definitely helps everyone when it comes to their fuel mileage in trying to ensure that should we get a green-white checker, they will have enough in reserve to make that full distance. Definitely no jeopardy of not making it to lap 200 if that is indeed the final lap. But looking at this wreck uh, of what we saw here, we're definitely getting into the point now with 30 laps to go, James, where guys are not giving what they were giving earlier it's more take uh and and that's just the aggression level has to go up if you're going to make these moves so the room that was being given the consideration that was being shown to the competition out on the track is gone at this point drivers are becoming a little more cutthroat and when that happens you're going to see more contact and that's going to get you some more yellow flags all righty now let's take a moment here and try and sort things out but I uh, do believe that we're going to take a very short commercial break here to get us lined up for the final few bits of action here at the Podium Esports Daytona 500. But before we go there, we'll go to Cisco Scaramuza. Hey guys, thank you very much. Let's go down here in the production trailer just to do a little bit of business here. Meanwhile, while we've been watching this race, we touched on a little bit earlier, but DOS XL not only resubscribed for two months, but gave out two sub gifts. One to uh, one of our commentators up there, John Theodore. You've been hearing him periodically here this evening. And Justin Botello. So thank you very much, Doc. Thank you very much, Das XL, for that. Also, Steve the Zombie cheered one bit and said, uh, cheers, great racing. So thank you very much for that, Steve. So what we'll do here is we'll quickly run through your whole running order here while the uh, guys up in the booth are taking a little bit of a break here. Set the Merchant right now, your leader. Second is Nick Ottinger. Third to Nicholas Morris. Fourth is right now Andrew Fash, the third. Jimmy Mullis runs fifth. Femi Olat is sixth. Seventh is Andrew Freenars. Eighth is going to be Brad Near. Ninth to Justin Levine. Tenth is Will Cooper. Cooley. Justin Knobloch runs 11th, 12th to Ashton Crowder, 13th is Raul Alves, 14th is Derek Justice, 15th to Justin Bolton, 16th Briar Little Prod, 17th is Christian Peterson, 18th to Gary Sexton Jr., 19th is Matt Cucker, and 20th is Steve Sheehan. John Gorlinski runs 21st, 22nd to Kyle Brummett, 23rd to Chris Sherburn, 24th to Adam Benefield, Colin Bowden runs 25th, 26th to Dylan Jones, 27th to Brandon Holder, 28th is Michael Conti, we saw him on pit road, 29th is Daniel Falkingham, 30th is Chris Canfield, 31st is Donald Skalinka, 32nd, Kenneth McCullough Jr., 33rd is Josh Bonwell, Chris Samard, 34th, everybody here was either caught up in that last accident or more laps down, Donald Powers runs 35th, Aaron McEachern runs 36th, 37th to Malik Ray, 38th is Logan Crest, 39th to Tyler Dalton, Graham Bolin runs 40th, and uh, Colin Keister right now running 41st, 42nd and 43rd is Ryan Hill and Tyler Young. So as we go through that, also do want to give a shout out once again, hey, if you want some uh, Podium Esports merch, head over to our merch, merch store, PodiumEsports.com slash merch for 20% off hats and shirts during Daytona 500 only. So during this event, head over there, get your hat, get your shirt. Uh, a couple people have been ranting and raving about how good the quality is. I'm still waiting on mine. So uh, why don't you beat the producer of Podium Esports, go get that merch today podiumesports.com forward slash store and finally as we send things back up to the booth one last time hey jd what's that hashtag again we'll run it for you right now hashtag coming july 2019 coming 
July 2019. Here's what we're talking about. Or not. Let's try that one more time. Do, do, do. There we go. How about that? So we'll pass things up to the booth here as the graphic finally works. Give it back, finally, to take us to the end of this thing. James Pike, David Shieldhouse, James Corhula, and John Theodore. Gentlemen? Cisco, he's going to kill you when you call him Shieldhouse again. So Shieldhouse, Shieldhouse. remember that I... Sorry, I, yeah, I, I know. I, I, know. I, I, it, 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 I, I'll, I'll, I have a great story to tell at some point. I don't know if we'll get it on the broadcast, but let's make sure we hit the top 10 for this restart to come on that 174, 26 to go. We get back to the line. We'll be set to Merchant, Nick Ottinger, Nick Morse, Andrew Fayos, Timmy Mullis, Femi Olat, Andrew Freenars, Brad Neer, Justin Levine, and Will Cooley. Your top 10 here at Daytona as the laps begin to wind down and we get closer to finding out who will take home the GT Omega Racing Subaru. It is Seth the Merchant who leads them back to Green Ottinger. Got a pretty good reset on the top side, though. And now I think it's just going to suffer only because Andrew Fayos did not. Bit of a gap between the 47 and the 7 machine. And so the Merchant down to the bottom now with help from Nick Morris and the 3 machine. Who else is down there? Jimmy Mullis and Andrew Freenars in the double zero trying to push along. And that bottom lane. Oh, wow. How about Ottinger going to the bottom to leave? Freenars up there. So Freenars is going to have to wait for Femi Olad as the bottom lane takes control here at Daytona. Uh, Andrew Fayash in the seven out on the outside line, right alongside Andrew Farinar is there getting a big push. Femiola now once again, big move up top. Ottinger and Mullis. Oh my gosh, a huge move there. Going to try and get around Nick Morse and Seth the Merchant. The big surge on the outside lane. If they have enough help, they might be able to make this thing happen. Freynar seems to stick on the bottom. Levine down on the bottom. So it's Fayash and Olat up on the top shelf. Can they get to the back bumper and help? Everyone just trying to get into the position they think is best, but all this cars and all this little space, James. I'm not sure how they can keep doing in these kind of big moves without bringing out another yellow flag. A lot of shuffling here between the top and the bottom lanes of John Theodore. If you're in this spot here in the pack, how do you make sure, do, at this point, do you even care if somebody just slides down in front of you? How much are you trying to watch for that versus making sure that you're in a good enough position to win this race, knowing that if someone cuts across you or you cut across someone else, your chance to win the race is over almost instantaneously. I mean, at this point, it, 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 you're not giving a lot. It's pretty much all take. There, it, there aren't a lot of friends left in this race. Um, we've seen how dominant the front is, and the, th the, the double-edged sword of that is that the more dominant that front position is, the more aggressively people are going to be in trying to get, acquire that position. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking right now, the three and the double zero, and the 09 behind the 57. 57 better hope that those guys are uh, more worried about dropping to the back than they are about going forward because if two or three of those guys jump up all at once and the 57's got a big gap behind them, they will sail right on past. So, uh, you know, everyone behind there, they're really trying to position themselves forward so that they can be in the spot to make that kind of move to go for the win of the Daytona 500. We know Seth Merchant would love to have the help of a certain Christian Peterson, who is currently a little bit further back in this field. Peterson currently scored in the 13th spot. He's got help from another one of the Vince Racing drivers, Matt Cucker in the 69. You see those two race each other a lot on Wednesday nights here in particular. And the Podium Esports Street Science Series of the Cars Esports Tour that you can see right here on the Podium Esports Network on that night. But now those two, I think, if the merchant would have his way, those two would find their way up towards the front of this field and get up to help the merchant because three drivers on the same team controlling this field. I don't know if it would quite be Stuart Haas at Talladega last fall on Mr. Shieldhouse, but uh, something pretty similar, I think, would play out. I'm not sure there's many things that could live up to the hype of what Stuart Haas did at Talladega last fall. Uh, that remains to be seen if that can be a rebirth in another form. But as I look at it, everybody on the low side right now. And again, Andrew Fayosh, one of the few drivers who's really wanted to try and work that top consistently lap after lap. He's got a lot of help from behind now. The likes of Christian Peterson and the 69 there as well. Matt Cucker. I haven't talked about Matt Cucker, the defending late model series champion here at the big track of Daytona, trying to flex his muscles with his Wednesday night buddy of Christian Peterson. Those two, a venerable duo. Uh, but here at the big tracks and the big stock cars, making a pretty good representation of themselves now 13th and 15th, respectively. 
Big thanks to Jason R. Long for the bits there. As you see, I look at Raul Alves. We talked about teammates here in this race. Nick Morse currently runs in P2. Sort of waiting to see if Raul Alves can get up there and get to the outside. There's a pretty big gap between... Uh, looks like that is that the nine i think that's the nine machine of justin no not justin bolton the nine machine of brad near excuse me and then briar Laprad a little bit further back and that number 54 twitch machine he comes through and if he can get back out to the nine machine then they might be able to make something happen on the outside but with the confusion right back there i'm a little surprised that alvis hasn't been able to make use of the help from justin bolton in the 36 to get back up to the front of this field I'll be honest, and I know as a professional, I need to just kind of state, and I use that term very, very loosely here as uh, uh, the term professional, but when it comes down to this point of the race, I just can't help it. I've become a, just a full-blown race fan. The racing that we're seeing and the intensity that these guys are doing, the moves that they are doing, and just great racing, I just get so excited at this point of the race. I'm just getting so amped up for this finish. We're seeing guys really start to make some good moves, start to work together, start to make that high side happen, and we're seeing a lot of... I, again, I'm going to see that 46 now. Uh, Jimmy Mullis, he's going to start moving up there on the high side. And we're going to see the 09. I think the look up there of Justin Levine uh, join that outside line. He's going to break the momentum of that outside line, but let's see if they can get it back going again. Well, they're going to keep moving up there. So they're going to go side by side now with Andrew Feynarge, and he's going to move up there. Nicholas Morse is going to be his next victim. Let's see if we get all the way up there to set the merchant there, and let's see if we can have a new leader here with that 09 of Justin Levine. Justin Levine making moves here. And a friendly reminder, we do not have slouches at all in this Daytona 500 field here at Program Sports. The strength of the field for this race coming into today was 5,298. A solid few hundred above even what we have in the Podium Esports Elite Series Gold Division. So you have some of the best of the best in sim racing here right before your eyes competing for $7,500 and a GT Omega Racing Sim Cockpit. That will go to the winner of the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. Seth DeMers should currently pacing this field here as we come underneath the 20 lap to go more. I'm getting a little bit nervous about this inside line right around Nick Ottinger in the 47. Things were getting stacked up down the back straightaway as they approach turn three. A lot of checkups and a lot of wayward bouncing around. Then when we've seen these guys get a little bit off kilter, not lined up, and they start bumping each other, we've seen cars get turned around that way as Bolton nearly gets turned off the right front of Brad Near thinks better of it, jumps back to the high side. But that's what really brought out our first yellow was a, a misaligned bump from Colin Bowden to Colin Keister. And I'm seeing a lot more of that as these guys want to get down to the inside lane. They just run out of momentum. They start checking up and they start hitting each other. If we're going to get more of that, that could lead to our next caution flag. I don't want to see that happen, but I am getting a little bit nervous about all the jostling on that bottom lane. And that brings me to a point that I hadn't had the chance to make yet, and one that I had sort of been bookmarking in my head to bring back up. Good that you have teammates that can help you get up to the front of this field at Daytona, but at the same time, it might not always be the best thing because we saw Colin Keister and Colin Bowden work so well together for the first three quarters of this race, and then an ill-time bump from Bowden took Keister out and pretty much drove both of them out of contention for the victory here at Daytona. So. You know, it's sort of a doubles-edged sword in a sense. Good that you have the help, but you also want to make sure that the help doesn't end up putting you in trouble either. And I'm, I'll be honest, I don't want to be on that bottom line now. Those guys are getting really aggressive. They're making some really big bumps, and they are losing a lot of momentum by doing that. And we're seeing that outside line. That outside line will be the one that's going to prevail here. We're seeing them now coming up there. That's that 36 car of Justin Bolton getting pushed out by the number seven of Andrew Fayash. They are making some moves there on that outside line. That inside line right now is getting way too aggressive. They will not come out victorious now at this point of the race. I want to be on that outside line. I want to be on it now. Do you want to be on it now? Do you want to be up there now? Are you worried that you'll fall a little bit too far back to make the moves that you need to win this race? Now, those are all the big questions that I think these drivers are going to have to sort out here. It's not necessarily going to become any easier, though it does seem like it's calmed down a little bit here within the past few moments as we see about the top five there back to Nick Ottinger and that 47 for JGD Daugherty racing there. Hanging on, trying to figure out if he wants to go to the top or the bottom, sliding it up just enough to break Justin Blue. Goodness, I'm watching all my names. Justin Levine, I did have that right, but Ottinger goes up to the top side. Now he's pushing Jimmy Mullis, who's got a good run there through the trioval. I like the move. I think now is the time as we're getting close to 15 laps to go. 
these moves do take time. You're not going to be able to pull it off in just one lap. And so if you got a, a move in mind and you got help to go, you might as well start trying to make that move. It might take you multiple laps to pull it off, especially on the high side. We've seen how indecisive drivers can be from top to bottom. They jump up there, think it's going to be a good move. It peters out. They go back down low if the opportunity is there. Somebody's going to have to really dedicate themselves to the high side if they're going to make it work. As now we see Seth the Merchant wiggle up the track just a little bit to break that draft from behind him of Nick Morse, I think. Haven't really seen him try and do that to work the lanes yet. The Merchant's got to be careful. If Morse gets a good bump from behind from Ferenars, he's going to be pushed right into that hole. If the Merchant tries to cover it, it'll be too late. You're going to make moves. you got to make them quick. These lazy moves are not going to work in the closing laps. As they all sneak around the lap car, Chris Simone, I was watching that for about half a lap just to see if that might throw a wrinkle into things here, but they all managed to get around some more cleanly. So we're back as you were, and no traffic here for about a half a lap with the rest of this field. So they've got plenty of room to race now. It's going to be all up to this lead pack to see how things shake out at the World Center of Racing. And it's just going to take one slip up from that inside line there. Someone getting too aggressive and uh, hitting someone wrong and everyone having to check up on that inside line. We're going to three see. Wide no, three, three wide though. The lead. Crazy. They dump, they dump Seth the Merchant and they just completely set him off in the middle and Jimmy Mullis goes to the front of that outside line now and you've got the 47 and Nick Ottinger stuck all the way up on the top side all by himself and Ottinger is going to drop back in right in front of I believe Oh, goodness, I can't cut track with things. That's Femi Olat, the 22, that he managed to sneak in front of. But, oh, Seth the Merchant was nearly caught out there big time. But it is now, oh, big bump there from Seth the Merchant now. Big bumps on the top side there. Aggression level ramping up as we get to 10 to go here at Daytona. That's how you know we're getting close to payday time. The aggression is going through the roof as Seth the Merchant absolutely got caught out, not in a position he expected to be in. Nick Ottinger lucky to salvage. Uh, falling back in the line on the high side in the eighth position really forced himself into a spot that really wasn't there in front of Femi Olat. Olat didn't necessarily give it to him. His look out. Brad Neer in the nine goes down to the inside and turns one and two. He's down into the grass, into the inside wall, up on the left side wheels. And that's going to bring an end to the race for Brad Neer in a very bizarre situation. I'm not sure what happened to him. Looked like the car just hooked up left without any inputs. Bring out the replay for you here momentarily, but no yellow flag yet. He spun way down to the inside. And, and never mind. Ah, we're going to hang out here and keep our eyes at the foot of this field. But Brad Near hard into the wall, and we'll see how things shake out. But no yellow flag on that one as it does not pose a threat to the racing line or anyone within it here. So watching this lead group here, it is Jimmy Morris on the outside, Nick Morris on the inside here, working at 189 of 200 now, coming down to 10 laps to go in the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. That really screwed up the momentum for that outside line there with that happening. And then Seth the Merchant, who was earlier just a few laps ago before Nicholas Morse, uh, has moved him out of the way. Now, Seth the Merchant's going to have to go from leader to pusher. How well can he get Jimmy Mullis up there? And let's see if he's able to get back to that lead. He's going to have to work really friendly. There's a big run here going into turn three. He's going to go side by side here with Nicholas Morse as they enter uh, three and four coming off here to the line. Let's see who's going to be leading here at the end of this lap as we come to 10 to go. 10 to go, coming up here at Daytona. John Theodore, back to you. You talked about how it would be a madhouse at this stage in the race. Can you describe what it's like for those of us who haven't had the chance to really be in a pressure pack situation like this? Just how do you react to moves? How do you race? How do you process everything when there is so much pressure and so much on the line? Just keep your eyes peeled. You keep the grip on that real nice and tight and you just try to anticipate what's about to happen before it does so that you're in, posi in position to take advantage of someone else's mistake or make sure that you avoid correctly and, and keep your car and your momentum going forward as we uh, see the 46 of Jimmy Millis finally able to clear on the outside there and uh, get down in front of Nick Morse for the lead. So here we go now, 10 laps to go here at the World Center of Racing. Cloud cover coming over this track. Track temps are dropping. Grip is increasing, but the level of intensity is up as well. And they've all started to shuffle back down into single file racing. And I wonder if this may well be the proverbial calm before the storm, before they all shuffle out and go double wide to try and make things happen. But look at this. It is Justin Levine and Seth Demerchant, the Lone Rangers on the top side, trying to make it work and hang on to the front of this train here. 
Two men on a mission on the outside lane are Seth Demersion and Justin Levine. Just not enough help from behind. Everyone wants to be on the bottom now as they run through here back to the trioval one more time. Seemingly calmer this lap, but again, that inside lane starts to stack up right about this point. Guys got to be on their toes as they check up on the brakes to not run each other over. There's going to be some more big moves coming up here again as each lap winds down the driver and each mine has a timer going off saying, hey, it's time to go. We got to start making moves if we're going to get up to the front. Nobody in this field wants to run where they are right now unless it's Jimmy Mullis out front. So to make those moves happen, you have to allow time. You have to organize and get up there to make it happen. You just can't drive through, guys. So far, they're doing a nice job as they get broken up ever so slightly. So here we go. Now coming to nine here. Nine laps to go left, working to eight when they get the next time by. Making things happen is the 46 of Jimmy Mullis out of Midland, North Carolina. Nick Morse now behind him out of Colorado, trying to find his way up towards the front of this once again, waiting to see if his teammate Raul Alves can make a jump up towards the front of this, but he's currently buried in 14, and no one wants to go to the high side anymore. Outside, Justin Levine and Nick Ottinger, who looked out there for a moment, but decided against it, and is now down to the bottom of the racetrack. I don't think they're going to fan out much, David Schillenhaus, until we get to maybe two or three laps to go from here on out now they should they just need to keep riding for right now but if they got help in the form of a spotter or somebody else in a team communication channel to start working with these other drivers around them now is the time to start leveraging start cutting those deals saying hey come work with me we're going to jump to the outside with four laps to go we're going to get up there and ride with justin levine and seth to merchant to try and make something happen are you in or are you out you got to cut those deals now if you haven't cut the deals already, you may be in trouble if you don't have a deal to work with here. As you see, a lot of action towards the back of this group as they try and find their way up to the front of this. But Demerchik and Levine are the two on the top side who have been committed up there. Everybody else on the bottom. But those two, as we've seen so many times throughout this weekend, if you have drivers who know how to sign draft, David, you have drivers that can hang up at the front of this field. And that's exactly what Demerchik and Levine are able to do right now. And no surprise, you're both of them with incredibly high eye ratings. That side draft is working so well right now for Seth Demerson and Justin Levine. They're holding on magnificently on the outside lane, even though they're outmatched by two cars. They Oh, they got oh, that cloud of smoke really scared me in front of them. That was the 56 of Josh Bonwell getting off the track. But nonetheless, the side draft effect that demerchant has been using, he saw how that worked against him when he lost the lead. Now, look at him get right up alongside Jimmy Mullis, Nick Morris, Andrew Freynar's on the bottom there. But give a call to Justin Levine doing a great job pushing along. He's got no no help from behind. Two versus four. The two are prevailing down the back straightaway. The two are prevailing because I see a gap forming right there between the number one of Justin Knobloch and the 47 and Dick Ottinger. And that might be the gap that Seth DeMerch and Justin Levine need to get to the front of this field. Though, as I say that, naturally, here comes Ottinger with a big run to the high side. He'll go to the top side, as will Femi Elmont, as will a lot of these drivers. And maybe that might be the death knell for Knobloch and Freenars. And Ottinger will go up there. Everybody else will stay back down to the bottom. But here comes Nick Ottinger for J. ATG Doherty Racing in the 47 here as we get down to it at the World Center of Racing. Very, very close stuff here. David Shieldhouse, how excited are you for this end of the race? We're coming down to it here and I have a feeling you can see anybody in the top 10 potentially win this or we may have a wreck perhaps. I'm just trying to, to take it all in right now, trying to gather my breath for these last five laps. It seems that the deals that have been cut, they're resigned to him now. Ottinger wants to join the fray on the high side. I do believe he needs a little more help. Maybe Olat jumps up there, maybe Justin Bolton, as they got a group of cars behind him. It's still going to take more than three cars at this point to get into the fray and get that top lane pushed out front so that the leader, Seth Demerchant, of that outside lane can clear Jimmy Mullis. I don't doubt that if Demerchant can clear him, look at the shove he gets into one and two. If he can clear him, he'll pull down in front of him just to protect himself. At this point, it's every man for himself. And who knows what will happen here as we currently are sitting on four laps to go in the voting of East Four State Total 500. And the top six are all side by side. I wonder who will jump to the top side from behind this top six, the back half of the top ten, to try and jump up and get a piece of the action at the front of this field. It's still Jimmy Mullis in control of this down on the bottom for Richmond Raceway Esports. That Toyota Owners 400 Toyota Camry. But as they work their way here to the start finish line, we will have three laps to go. And it is still able to race within this top 15, I'd say. 
Absolutely. One wrong step and a whole bunch of cars can wipe, be wiped out. We've seen that already once here. That outside lane hanging tough. I'm so impressed with what Seth the Merchant's able to do. And he's got great help from behind in Justin Levine and Nick Ottinger. These guys pushing as best they can, trying to stay in line. But Ottinger fades to the middle now as the Merchant explores a little bit more of the racetrack to the right down the back straightaway. Not sure that's necessarily the strategy that's going to be the best. You see how much that allows Jimmy Mullis and the inside lane to pull away. That outside lane got completely disorganized last time down the back stretch. Here we go, coming to the stop and inside. Nick Morris gets a little bump. They keep it together here. Still in one piece. No wreck. Somehow, and now they wreck. There goes Renars. And there goes Ottinger. And somehow, it's just Renars that manages to hang into it. And Renars hits the wall hard. And somehow, somehow got missed by everyone. And we will go to a green white checker. And that 205 will indeed be necessary. Uh, what heartbreak for Nick Ottinger, definitely in the place he needed to be, but it all started ahead of him, and Femi Olak got a piece of that as well. And just that inside line, Nick Morris got a little bit of a bump from behind from Andrew Ferenars, nothing he could do, just completely out of control, hooked him right in the middle of that pack and up into the wall right into Nick Ottinger, nowhere to go. They kept it together longer than they thought, but you see Femi Olak right there trying to give space to both cars. You just can't do it at that speed with nobody lifting. Andrew Farinar's got into the back of Nick Morris. That's what started all this coming into the trial. Morris managed to gather it up and then came back on track. And as Farinar's was trying to give him space, Femi Olat was right there in between Farinar's and Ottinger. And the three of them all just sort of got smushed together in this madness. And I think everybody else managed to somehow clear this and come on the bottom and survive all of it. Uh, amazingly enough. So just the three cars really there. Olat, Ottinger, and Farinar's with damage. Everybody else managed to escape this. And now now we get the chance to reset here for what will be one attempt at a green-white checker finish. And I recall maybe an hour and a half, two hours ago, saying uh, what uh, what a special layer of complexity that would add to this race if we did indeed get a green-white checker. And here we go. We're right in that situation. Uh, so now as a, a driver, you really got to pull those bells tight, cut some deals under yellow flag conditions. You, you already know where you're going to be restarting and who's going to be around you. So you got to be busting up the comms with those guys to say, hey, stick with me. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to approach this as you set up uh, what you think is the best move to take the lead away. For Jimmy Mullis, he's kind of in a tough position. It's going to be really tricky to defend from everybody. Even out front, he's going to have to stay on that yellow line. That is truly going to be his best friend. Nowhere else to go but right down there. We've seen it be the best place to be. Those that are behind him, how much will they want to work with him or try and play for themselves to get a checkered flag? And you look here, you see the stint numbers up, and I think that's going to be very, very critical because we may have fuel issues for some of these drivers. We talked about it right at that pit stop that came at the caution for Colin Bowden and Colin Keister. We may have drivers who will need a few caution laps in order to get to the end here on fuel pitting when they did under yellow. So we'll see who shakes out here, but everybody up towards the front of this is already clear by a significant amount. And I wonder, interestingly enough, as I I look at the stints if Justin Knobloch might be in the best position of all he's only gone 30 laps and should be clear I think if he managed to top off for fuel I look at Daniel Falkingham in the 10 30 laps since he was last on pit road Brandon Holder same situation uh, as well so some of these guys in a more uh, advantageous position for fuel at this point you got what you got if you're Jimmy Mola self Seth the Merchant Justin Levine Nick Morris any of these guys up inside of the top 10 you're not coming to pit road. You're just going to have to see what you got and go for it, knowing it's only one attempt at the green-white checker. No unlimited situation here. So either you got enough fuel to make it or you don't. You can control that right now under caution flag by consuming as little fuel as possible, and that's what all these drivers are doing as you see them running on the apron, shutting the engine off and just letting it coast. But you just you can't let that get into your mind. you got to focus on the moves you have to make under green. If the fuel runs out, so be it. But keep in mind, James... Somebody runs out of fuel under green while this big pack's rolling along. That could touch off a massive incident. It could touch off a massive incident, and it's going to be very close for a lot of these drivers. Uh, nobody really knows whether or not any one of these drivers who, who pitted some 40 laps ago can actually make it, and it, it may come down to someone who managed to top off to get everything done, and it may be one of those drivers towards the back of the field. I'm trying to think of the one. I want to say maybe was it... Brandon Holder? 
I'm trying to remember as we try and figure this out here, but I remember one of the Barber Ford machines did come down to top off under, and it was indeed Brandon Holder in the five who topped off under that caution that we had a little bit ago before this one. I, I forget exactly how it all panned out, but Holder, I think, would be if everybody else runs out, He's the one on the lead lap that should definitely have the fuel to make it to the end of this race. So if everything goes crazy, Brandon Holder may be in a pretty good position here. Absolutely could. Him and Daniel Falkingham, those are the two that I see, uh, at least on my timing and scoring, that are in the best position uh, for fuel. The, I think they pitted on the same lap, topped off on the same lap. I'm showing 31 laps since they last took service for both of those drivers. So the 10 and the 5... Could be the two big players if fuel does indeed become a factor before this is all completed. It's You're sweating bullets right now if you're in the top 10. If you're Jimmy Mullis, especially, you've been leading this race down into the closing laps. And now you get that late race yellow flag behind you. And it puts you into a fuel situation you didn't want to have to face. You really strategized and planned for 200 laps. Trying to save as much under yellow as you could in case it happens. But you can't save... A whole heck of a lot. You can only do so much. So, again, continue to run on the apron. Shut the engine off. That's all you can do for right now. Also, we'll take a note here the fact that Briar LaFrad started dead last on this grid in the 43rd spot and is up in the top 10. And I believe, by default, is the hardest charge of the race and has gained more positions in this field than anyone else. So, big run for Briar LaFrad, at least as it stands. But there is so much left that could transpire here at the World Center of Racing. It's a pretty big move to come from last up into the top 10. And it took him quite a while to get up there. Uh, and here he finds himself now in the green-white checker situation in that position in the top 10. And who knows, things go the right way. If a couple guys get out of shape, he could go from worst to first and claim that big chunk of that purse. And also a pretty nice sim racing rig, too. As we out, lights out on the pace car. Lights are out on the pace car. And we will indeed have a two to go here at daytona it will be one attempt at a green white checker finish and the next flag whatever happens ends the race so this will be your restart top 10 for the final restart of the inaugural of the podium esports daytona 500 jimmy mullis We'll start from P1. Seth the Merchant starts second. Justin Levine will roll off in the third spot. Fourth will be the three of Nick Morris. Jimmy Olot in the 22 will start fifth. Justin Nawak will roll off from sixth. Nick Ottinger will roll from seventh. Eighth will be the 36th of Justin Bolton. Ninth will be Brian LePrat and the National Crowd will restart from tenth. It's not uh, your average organic green-white checker, as you like to joke about here. It is a green-white checker. If you catch the inflection, as I've said it there, it's going to be get everything you can as quickly as you can. And for Jimmy Mullis, defend, defend, defend. Hold the pedal to the metal on the bottom line. Use that double yellow line as your best friend and hope that guys like Justin Levine, Femi Olatz, and company stick with you. Keep an eye on that 47 to Nick Ottinger as well. Remember, he was involved in that incident along with Femi. Both of them sustained some damage. How will those two cars run? Something to keep an eye on. It is time to bring us here to the end of this. We have been racing all weekend for this moment. A GT Omega Racing Sim Rig here to go to the winner of the inaugural podium of Esports Daytona 500. Jimmy Mullis, the control car here for the final restart. As we get the green flag, we are underway here for the end of this 200 lap 500 mile race. And Brian LeBron almost goes around right at the beginning. Yeah, they're not wasting any time. And there goes Raul Alves around in the middle of the field. They're wrecking behind them. We are still moving, though. This field, I believe the yellow flag is out. I'm not sure what to say there. These guys just showed no patience getting up to speed, and that might just be the end of it. I will wait for race control to make sure that we have the correct information on everything. I don't know how this is going to shake out entirely, so we shall see how everything shakes out. And I'm, I, I'm not going to say a word. Uh, I, I believe, I believe, I know how this will affect everything at the point of the field, but I want to wait and make sure we have confirmation. I know who thinks he won this race, and that's the 57 of Seth DeMerchant. You can tell demonstratively from where he is running in front of Jimmy Mullis. It's all going to be about the time that the yellow flag flew. We'll have to go back and review. Not a job that I envy for the competition committee here at Podium Esports. They're going to have to make the call here. But clearly you can tell that Seth the Merchant believes he has won at the Daytona 500 just waiting on the official call. 
waiting on the official call here from race control uh, there is that chance that the merchant could have been in control of this field jimmy mullis is the other one who's just sort of sitting there and i don't know how they are going to score it we're just gonna wait and see what happens but in either case solid runs for both of those drivers absolutely and it's a bit anticlimactic absolutely a little disappointing that uh, we couldn't get the full lap of racing in, and everybody just stacked up on the restart. Sort of to be expected as well. Everyone really anxious, wanting to get on the, the throttle and go, and everyone just running into each other without lifting. That's sort of what you get at that point. And uh, when you're not willing to lift or give the guy in front of you a break, contact happens, guys get sideways. They tried to save it, but in the end, it was Raul Alves in the 50, the first one that I saw go around in the middle of the field. So... Nothing here yet. The merchant's certainly sliding around and uh, seems to be pretty happy with himself. But again, no word from race control yet as to who is the winner of this race. I believe it will be one of Seth the Merchant or Jimmy Morris, but we just have to sit and make sure that we are correct on this and waiting for the official word to come down before we get an answer to the question. So I, I hate to leave everyone in the audience in suspense, but to be fair, we don't know. And so results are clear and good and we shall see what that officially means i believe we just heard receive word that it is now official seth demerchant is the winner of the podium esports daytona 500 waiting and it is indeed official seth demerchant in the 57 for vincere racing is the man who gets to write his name in the history books as the winner of the inaugural podium esports daytona 500 and for everybody at vincere racing and for the 57 of seth demerchant how big is this how important is this and how awesome is this for the fallen friend of theirs that they lost a few days ago? I know everybody racing there with heavy horns, but to bring home the Daytona 500, how big, how big for Seth DeMarcia? Uh, it's indescribable. You cannot put a value on that for what that does for the driver, for the team, for everybody involved with the entire operation to make this thing happen for him. The elation that he feels right now will carry with him for a long time to come as they celebrate. Even under the circumstances of losing a friend, it makes it all the sweeter to come here to the World Center of Racing, race for 500 miles, and survive it all to claim that coveted checkered flag. And so as Seth DeMerchant wheels away in victory here, in what will one of, I would say, probably the biggest one of his racing career. We are going to take a commercial break, but stick with us because we'll come back right here with the Daytona 500 post-race show. And we will run through the full field run now to tell you where your favorite driver finished, as well as talk to some of your top finishers, including the inaugural podium of eSports Daytona 500 champion, the 57 of Seth DeMerchant. You're watching coverage from Daytona International Speedway here live on the Podium eSports Network. For nearly 65 years, the Porsche Club of America has offered an unparalleled experience to Porsche owners across North America. Now, PCA is proud to offer a new experience to the 130,000 members of the largest single mark car club in the world. Introducing the Porsche Club of America Sim Racing Series in partnership with iRacing and Podium Esports. 60 PCA members will compete for victory with the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car on eight iconic North American circuits. All broadcast live on the iRacing Esports Network.
all of you who believe that sim racing can be bigger. We're down to it. What should be one last restart. For all of you who believe sim racing can be better. Five laps to go when they cross the stripe. Your moment. Here they come back to the trial one of the start finish line. Is now. He gets bumped though. He gets shoved out of the way. Here he comes. They make contact up at the line. I can't tell who's going to get it. Introducing Podium Esports, your new home for the best competition in sim racing. The outside, they go side to side. They come down to the start and finish line. Featuring the Podium Esports Elite Series. The Podium Esports Truck Series. And much, much more. We get the green flag two laps to go here at Daytona. All broadcast live on the Podium Esports Network. What a run! More racing, bigger purses, and the best competition. Welcome to Podium Esports, launching January 2nd. Welcome back to the post-race show here for the Podium Esports Daytona 500 here on the Daytona International Speedway. And as you see, just how everything unfolded here at the end of this. Raul Alves was the one who went around under the yellow to end this thing on the first green white chunk of the tent. As everybody had made that mad scramble to the finish. But David Schildhouse, uh, a wild, wild weekend of racing there. Yeah, a lot of uh, racing action over the last couple of days culminates in this very dramatic moment where a green-white checker finish uh, goes into the spin cycle very quickly, and one very happy driver stands among the rest as the winner of this race. Had to overcome a lot to get to that position and survive the chaos in the closing laps. Uh, that's 500 miles of racing at Daytona for you. A lot of build-up to one very uh, big climax, and... In the end, it's Seth Demersion who gets the big payoff. Seth Demersion against the big payoff. And at this moment, we will run through what we have here in timing and scoring as the full field rundown to tell you where your favorite driver finished here in the inaugural podium at eSports Daytona 500. Seth Demerchant got the lead from Jimmy Mullis on that final restart to take the victory in the biggest of events here at Podium Esports today. Jimmy Mullis comes home in second for Richmond Raceway Esports. The three car of Nicholas Morris finishes P3 when it's all said and done. Justin Levine in the 09 finished in fourth. Justin Knobloch came home for the top five in the fifth spot. Justin Bolton continues our Justin train, finished sixth at the end of this race. Femi Olad in the 22 came home seventh, and then Ashton Crowner finished in eighth. Ninth was the 47 of Nick Ottinger, and Daniel Falkingham rounded out the top ten. Briar LaPrade comes home in 11th. Gary Sexton in 12th. Adam Benefield 13th. Chris Sherburn in 14th. Christian Peterson 15th. Colin Bowden in 16th. Raul Alvis there 17th. Matt Cucker in 18th. Steve Sheehan in 19th. And Will Cooley rounds out the top 20. 21st was the 5 of Brandon Holder. Andrew Fayosh finished in 22nd. 23rd was the 18 of Kyle Rummett. John Gorlinski finished 24th. Michael Conti in the 88 finished 25th. 26th was the 31 of Derek Justice. Andrew Freenars in the 27th finished, or er, Andrew Freenars in the double zero finished 27th. Dylan Jones was 28th, last car in the lead lap. And then Donald Skalenka and Kenneth McCullough Jr. finished 29th and 30th, one lap to bounce. 31st goes to Chris Canfield, Aaron McEckern in 32nd, Malik Ray disappointing run in 33rd after technical difficulties. Chris Samard 34th, Josh Bonwell 35th, Brad Neer in 36th, Donald Powers 37th, Tyler Dalton 38th, Logan Crest 39th, Colin Keister strong run early fades to a 40th place finish, Graham Boland, Tyler Young, and Ryan Hill finish out the 43 car field. 43 drivers out of 171 who qualified for this race. So in fairness, a big congratulations to all of them for making it this far and surviving qualifying on Friday night. A, a big honor for all of them. For one man, for one very, very excited. He gets to climb out of his car in victory lane as the inaugural podium esports Daytona 500 champion Seth Demerchin. How does that sound to you? Dude, I, I can't believe it. I thought when that first caution came out, I thought my race was over. Me and Justin on the top there were in such a good position. He was doing such a good job pushing. 
I, I don't know how he was doing it with so little cars we were doing for so long. I thought we were going to fall to the back. And uh, Nick just gave me an absolutely amazing push on that restart and got my nose out in front of uh, Jimmy right before that caution. I, I just I can't believe that just happened. So you come home with 850 of the $7,500 purse and more importantly, the GT Omega racing sim rig. What, what you going to do with the new equipment, Seth? I don't know, man. I might, I might have to build a new computer now too. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, and, and I know this one, I think takes on a little bit more significance just with everything that's happened at Vincere in the past few days. So to win for your little angel looking above, just uh, tell us about him and tell uh, as much as you can his story and how much this means to you, especially in context of all of that as well. Yeah. Christian's a uh, friend sadly passed away a few days ago and we uh, put a memorial sticker on all of our cars and he was uh, watching us from above. Steezy. Ty Steezy. Uh, not forgotten uh, very, very soon in the eyes of NCU Racing. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the racing too now and just everything in those last 20 laps there. You were in the lead for a good chunk of this and nearly got hung out to dry in the middle. When that happened, where was your head? Oh, man. I, I don't know. I, I was so worried. I, I Especially when I pulled that block on Jimmy, when I when I initially had the lead and uh, Jimmy was coming up on a run on me and Nick and I pulled high and he took us three wide. I thought right there my race was over and I was going to fall back to the top 10. But like I said, Justin, he, he did an amazing job pushing. He's the only reason that I was able to step there. We had only two cars on the top for like probably 10 laps or so. No one else would come up. I don't know why. And then finally Ottinger came up and gave us help and uh, we, we were able to just hang on just enough to keep us close enough for that final restart. And were you worried at all, especially since you were sort of a lone wolf out there? Because, you know, we, we talked to the broadcast a lot about Christian Peterson and Kyle Brummett and company. All your teammates weren't really able to get up to you. Were you nervous sort of in the middle, especially that middle stretch of the final 100 laps? Yeah, about halfway through the race, Christian uh, missed his pit stall and had to back up and it left us separated. So I was kind of just playing lone wolf there kind of found help with uh nick morris we worked together a lot for the last like 60 laps of the race there and uh he's a big reason why i'm here and i think finally before we let you go uh first your thank yous is always here on all our buddy me sports broadcast and take a moment here to thank everyone that's made it possible for you to get into the victory lane here at daytona oh, all, all the teammates peterson irrigation for being on the car uh christian's dad i heard is watching so that's really cool and uh it just this what a great event this was so much fun actually i i got one more for you as i think about it when you stack this up in terms of your accomplishments in your sim racing career where does this sit i mean it's it's definitely up there i think it's probably probably yeah my top one it's real close to my door road to pro win i that was really special too but th this was amazing really what a stacked field we had <laughs> Yeah, almost 5,300 SOF in this one. So we know it means a lot, especially with Steezy and company watching from above. But before this go, anything else that you have to say? The floor is yours here. I don't know, dude. I'm, I'm still stunned that I even won the race, man. That, that It's just amazing. Well, Seth, from all of us at Podium Esports, congratulations on winning the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. And, uh, We'll see you here in the not too distant future. I forget if you're running trucks tonight, to be fair, because my brain's sort of out of it. But uh, if we're not going to see you in trucks, it'll be back for the Elite Series next week, I think. Yeah. 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 I'm not in the trucks, but I'll be back in the Elite Series on uh, Thursday. All righty. Well, Seth, congratulations once again. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Your champion of the inaugural Podium Esports dates on a 500, Seth the Merchant there. In the number 57, Peterson Irrigation Chevy Camaro for Vincere Racing. And from him, I know it'll be a bit of bitter disappointment from the man who finished in P2 because he was the leader on the restart and just about got it done. But David Schillhouse is here to talk with the runner-up in this race for Richmond Raceway Esports, the number 46 Toyota Camry of Jimmy Mullis. Jimmy, 500 miles here at Daytona. In the end, you come home with a second-place finish. You spent a lot of that 500 miles up front and looked to be in good shape until that late race yellow flag. What word can you use to describe how you're feeling right now after getting second? I mean, I guess the best one would be heartbreak. Uh, it's just, it's tough, man, but, you know, being in that position at that point of the race and just even having a shot at it is really cool. So, uh you know, can't thank everybody that worked with me throughout the race enough for, uh, 
you know, putting me in that spot. And uh, I don't know, it just sucks. Couldn't get it done. When the yellow flag flew there, setting up the green, white checkered flag, we were talking a lot about fuel mileage and fuel possibly being an issue, but also needing to complete that extra lap for the green, white checkered finish to even get back to the checkered flag. In your mind, what were you more worried about the guys behind you causing a situation that ended the race before you could even complete that lap or fuel? I was more worried about just, uh, like you said, the guys causing something out back and uh, ending it before, you know, the race was actually over. Uh, I was good on fuel, so I wasn't worried about that. When that caution came out uh, there at the end, I was, you know, pretty excited because I figured if I just got a good restart, then I could, you know, hold off and uh, get it done. But I don't know what happened behind me. I don't know if the 09 spun his tires or, or what, but uh, he just didn't seem to get a good enough jump. And Nick done a good job of getting Seth out there, and, uh, yeah, I couldn't really do it by myself, so. We saw the teamwork come into play here. A lot of guys trying to help each other out throughout the course of this 500-miler. If you tried to jump to the outside, and you did a couple of times, what did it really take to make that high side roll? Uh, you just needed about three or four cars to work together, and, like, instead of having gaps in between each other, you had to be hooked up to actually go anywhere, and a lot of people struggled to have that happen. Uh, it seemed like me, Nick, and Conti, when we were working together, we were able to kind of make up some ground, but even with three cars, it was tough sometimes. So, uh, I mean, it just depended on how well you were able to hook up and uh, how many cars you had to really get anything going. Well, Jamie, I'll give you the opportunity to say hello to friends, family, sponsors, and everyone else who helps you and your team get it done here for a second place finish in the Daytona 500. Oh uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, my mom. I think she was watching. Uh, anybody else on uh, lockdown that was watching the race, thanks to them. Thanks to uh, Richmond Raceway Esports and Richmond for uh, everything they do for me. Uh, Sim Seats, you guys for the broadcast. And I uh, also want to give a shout out to uh, Ottinger and Conti for working with me throughout the race. It was a lot of fun. So. There you have it, folks. Your second place finisher, Jimmy Mullis. Jimmy, congratulations on the good run. I know you're heartbroken, but nothing to hang your head on on a strong performance here today. Thank you. So Jimmy Mullis comes home in P2, and now we slide to the man who is P3 and up in the top five pretty much the entirety of this race. You're pretty close to it, it seemed like. Nick Morris, I know not quite the win that you wanted, but still really, really solid run for you and everybody in high-performance motorsports. I got nothing to complain about. I don't know if you saw it, but I was facing right <laughs> with like three laps to go there. So uh, I can't believe I saved it. Um, I definitely wanted to win. I thought I had a shot when I snuck under a set there. Um, but I mean, I had tears in my eyes when I got third. I was so happy. Uh, my daughter came and gave me a hug and my wife did too. So it was like, I fe feels like a win. You know, this is a special event. Um, doesn't care anything past this and to, to win the amount of money that I did today. And, um, run a perfect race, which I almost lost the draft two or three times. Um, I'm, I'm as happy as can be. Um, I'm, I'm just super happy. It's the shades of, uh, I think of Roman Grosjean and I think it was 2016 in Australia. You guys, this is like a win for us. A win. Something like that, sort of. Uh, maybe I don't suck as much as Roman did in that team <laughs> at that time. Uh, I'm used to running up front, but uh, I mean, it's six hundred dollars, right? I mean, that's a lot of money. That's that's not that's that's a lot of money. And the fact that I get to even do that in something that I've done for free for fifteen years um, is incredible. So I'm so happy. Six hundred bucks. I love it. And um, I'm really happy for Seth. I'm really happy for Jimmy. And um, just can't believe I didn't wreck. And uh, I'm just so happy. <laughs> Yeah, I want to go back to that moment when you got the bump from Freenars because I was up in the booth. I was convinced you were about to go around in front of everybody there. How on earth did you save that thing? I'm not sure. You know, at the end of the races, intensity picks up and people stop lifting, right? And I was so hot and I'm, I'm, I was screaming at Jimmy. I'm like, just give me half a lane, dude. I just need to cool down like four degrees per corner and I can push you and I could, we could fend off the outside. But he just wasn't able to do it because... Um, he kept giving them air and that was making them faster. So I knew when Andrew, um, who I haven't raced with and, um, is, you know, up and coming, he's a really good driver, but doesn't have as much experience as some of the other guys out there. I knew he was going to hook me because, um, his car, the Chevys have that kind of, uh, almost like an old Pontiac nose. If you remember those, I knew he was going to hook me. So I was on Jimmy. I was trying to lift. I was trying to stay square cause I knew it was coming and, um, I have no clue how I saved it. I just got hooked. I turned to the left and, 
I just, I just blacked out. I just straightened back up, and then I didn't really didn't lose too much speed, so I came back on the track, and um, thank God. I, I don't know how I saved it, man. That's a once-in-a-lifetime save. I have a feeling we're going to have a few clippets off that, because in fairness, I would. That was incredible to watch, to be fair. So Now, you come away from this here. You are a competitor in the Elite Series on Thursday nights. I know it's not related, but being able to come through an SOF of over almost 5,300, over 5,000 very, very easily. Uh, surely this has got to be a huge boost for you, your confidence, everything. And it's got to mean the world to you to come away with a podium finish here. Absolutely. Uh, this is my fourth top five now, and I think my third top three in the last four races. So um, very happy. And, you know, I, I got to race with a bunch of peak drivers out there and I haven't been in peak since 2013. So it's going on six years now and I definitely want to get back. But um, to be able to hang with those guys and I feel like plate racing is by far the worst uh, discipline that I, I have. I'm not very good at it. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm stoked and, um, I'll take it. It's a great finish. And, um, I'm just ecstatic. Well, Nick, I know there are a lot of people that make it happen for you. So as always here on our podium, Esports broadcast, take a moment to send your thank yous, your shout outs to love that everyone who makes it happen for you in this number three car from peak appliance and high performance motorsports. Uh, I want to thank Raul Alves for running with me, Mason Weitzel as well, even though they didn't transfer in. Um, I got to thank Seth, Andrew, um, Jimmy for working with me today, as well as Andrew and Tyler Dalton, um, Andrew Fayish. I uh, got to thank Peak Appliance. I wasn't even going to run this race, and they paid the entry fee for me. Um, so I wouldn't even have been here. And then I got to thank my wife and daughter for letting me race today. So, um, and, and everyone else on HPM. So thank you so much for putting this event on. Thank you to Peak Appliance for letting me run. And uh, thank you, God, for letting me save that car and get a top three. Fair enough. Can't argue with that one either. Nick, congratulations on your podium finish from all of us here at Podium Esports. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday nights here in the Podium Esports Elite Series. Thanks, guys. And there are your podium interviews here for the top three finishers of the Podium Esports Daytona 500, the inaugural special event here from all of us at Podium Esports. And now it is time to turn to everybody in the booth here for the final thoughts. And you know what? How about this? Cisco Scaramuza, I'm going to come to you first because we got to hear you a little bit stepping out from behind the production trailer. What do you take away from this event here that's gone on all weekend and been built up for so much? It's a huge event, a huge operation. And now that it's done, what are your first initial thoughts? here as we come back to life here as it regularly is with podium race sports uh well i guess the first one would probably be um probably some insomnia a little bit of a headache um i'm exhausted it's been a crazy two days here on the production side on our end so i just of course want to give a huge call to everybody behind the scenes even even those who contributed even if it was a camera pack or graphics or anything like that you know, that's, it, you know, I, I'm so stoked to have such a great broadcast here and have everything, you know, we had a couple hiccups, obviously, but we survived and it was a really fun broadcast. We had a lot of fun and it really helped us out and it's going to help us out do a lot of more, you know, big things coming up here on Podium Esports. This uh, allowed us to really, you know, branch our wings out and make everything happen. So... You know, there's a lot more coming down the pipeline here. Obviously, we've talked about PCA. We've teased a little bit, but we still got racing to go here. We still got uh, stuff to deal with on the day to day. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of the stuff that we were able to develop for this race, we're going to be able to use in the rest of the broadcast. We're going to have a lot of fun. So that's that's my takeaway here. And on that note, so we make sure we get to them one more time. We thank them last night, but we'll also send a big thank you out as well to all of our auxiliary teams who came in to help commentate qualifying day yesterday. So the guys at Sim TV, Kyle Heyer and Finian DeCunha, big thanks to those two, and also to Rachel Whiteford and Gary Weaver, who came on board to help us with the broadcast for yesterday's smorgasbord of racing. Next, we go to John Theodore, who was up here as our driver analyst in the booth. John, I know you need to get ready for a truck race here in a little bit from New Smyrna. But before you go, final thoughts on today's action here from the World Center of Racing. I mean, that was a great race. Uh, my hat's off to uh, everyone at Podium Esports. You guys did an excellent job promoting, putting together, organizing all the work yesterday through all the gauntlet that was the qualifiers, everything. Um, to put on just an excellent show. It was an honor to be a part of this today. Um, 
big congratulations to uh, Seth Demerchant and that whole team. Um, I know that they were all hurting uh, after the loss of their friend coming into this race, so it's a big feel-good victory for that team. And, uh, yeah, just a real pleasure to be a part of this, and uh, I'm looking forward to racing the trucks tonight at New Smyrna with you guys. And also, for those of you and those of us in the broadcast who might not know you all that well, John, uh, A, tell everybody who makes it happen for you and where they can find you here on the internet, and especially here on Twitch TV. Sure thing. So uh, I am uh, broadcasting live uh, every race at uh, twitch.tv slash John underscore A underscore Theodore. And you can find all of my video on demand content at youtube.com slash John Theodore. Um, shout outs to the uh, different sponsors. iRacingiflag.com sponsored me for the Podium Me Sports Daytona 500. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the big show, but uh, big thank you to those guys. Uh, they provide some really cool equipment. Um, if you use my promo code S Theodore, you can get 50% off your purchase. And then um, the other sponsors that I run in uh, Podium Me Sports are uh, St. Louis uh, Tech Rescue St. Louis uh, in the Elite Series and Pot Bangers, which is a uh, local charity in the truck series. Well, John, I, I think I speak for everyone at Podium Esports when we say, uh, I know sitting up here in the booth, it, it was a disappointment to see you not make the race. I know it didn't pan out all that well, and uh, you were sort of a victim of circumstance in the duel last night. So disappointed to not see you in the event, but very, very happy that you decided to come up here in the booth with us. And it has been a genuine joy and pleasure to work with you up here in the booth. And we look forward to seeing you race tonight. And I hope we get the chance to have you up here for more of these events in the future, or, you know, maybe even better, you racing on track this time and getting down there and fighting for the victory yourself. That being said, thank you so much to John Theodore for coming in and talking to us here and being a part of our broadcast of the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Truly a pleasure and an honor. Next, we move to James Crowhula here, our three men in the booth. James, what are your takeaways from this mega event of events? I mean, uh, it was so enjoyable to watch a legit 500-mile race. No stages or anything. We just got to watch the race develop, and we saw it naturally break down and completely change there at the end. Uh, could not have had a more exciting finish uh, coming down to uh, overtime here in the very first Daytona 500 here on Podium Esports. Can't wait to come do it next year, but uh, right now I'm going to load up the uh, the old VW bus with, uh, with you and Cisco, and we're going to head down the road here to New Smyrna, and we'll be back up here in about an hour. Well, I mean, you're not wrong, but we still have one more man to talk to. Uh, as we say, thank you so much for your time, James, for helping us out here on the broadcast last night and being part of the team tonight. I know we'll see you around here on Thursday nights for the Podium Esports Elite Series broadcast. And finally, we turn to David Shieldhouse for the Shieldhouse of Final Thoughts here, Podium Esports Daytona 500 edition. I'm not sure what's really left to be said that hasn't already been touched on by the other illustrious members of this broadcast team. So I'll keep it simple at this point. A huge congratulations goes out to Seth Demersion and everybody else who made this 43 car field here today. It was not easy to do. This is an accomplishment in its own right to even say you participated in the event. But at the end of the day, everyone wants to know who the winner was. And it is Seth Demersion for him, Vincere Racing and everybody else involved with that team. A big tip of the cap from the sim racing community to get it done here today. He held off some of the biggest names in iRacing to win this race. And for him, this is a memory he will hold on to for a very long time. Indeed, Seth the Merchant, your winner, and will always be remembered as the inaugural champion of the Podium Esports Daytona 500. Uh, a quick reminder here that... We are not done racing tonight on the Podium Esports Network. Come back here in just about an hour, and you will see the regularly scheduled coverage of the Podium Esports Trunk Series live from New Smyrna Speedway as we celebrate Speed Weeks and the World Series of Amazon Stock Car Racing by bringing the Truck Series to that very famous short track in Central Florida. We slide a little bit inland here from Daytona to get there and see all the action there. And if you're interested on finding out more information on Podium Esports, head on over to the website, www.podiumesports.com. We run four series throughout our weekly adventures here. Our Elite Series is our Class A fixed series that runs on Thursday nights. Sunday nights, we have the Truck Series 
series and then we split our wednesdays on short tracks between our street stock series and the officially sanctioned series of the cars tour in real life the cars esport tour and the broadcast for all of those can be found right here on the podium esports network so if you're interested in seeing more racing from podium esports a friendly reminder it's not just the special event at daytona we're busy every week with action here on the podium esports network as we turn to my own personal final thoughts, uh, a, a huge honor to be part of this, a huge honor, uh, and I think a big thank you to everybody that was involved in this, from all of our race control admins, to our drivers, to the fans who watched the broadcast, to everybody who jumped on board and promoted it, who got on board from the very beginning and wanted to make this a very, very big deal. Uh, I am just quite simply floored that we had 171 entrants and a strength of field that is not going to be topped by too much stuff. Maybe Tuesday night might go above it, but for the most part, you're not going to see much better competition than what we had out here today, and that is why I put Fortress Home to the best competition in series. So for all of you, thank you so much for everything that you all did to make this a huge event. And I'll, I'll just toss this little carrot out here. Our goal is to try and do quarterly special events. So we have ideas for what we want to do next, but this will not be the last of them. And announcements on those special events, along with our uh, secret in July of 2019, will be made on the Podium Esports website in due course. So keep an eye out for that. We're not done yet. But... Finally, and at long, long last, it is time to close our broadcast of the Podium Esports Daytona 500. This inaugural event that has been such a madhouse and such a joy for all of us here at Podium Esports. So, for DJ Lyon, for Gary Sexton, for Kyle Barnes with Podium Esports, for tonight's producer, Cisco Scaramuza, for John Theodore, for James Grahula, and David Schildhouse, I am James Pike, the voice of Podium Esports. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast of the first ever special event from Podium Esports. And stick around because we'll be back here in just about an hour from New Smyrna Speedway for the regularly scheduled Truck Series action. A big congratulations once more to South DeMerchant on winning the inaugural Podium Esports Daytona 500. And we'll see you all in an hour. Until then, get some dinner and we'll see you all back here on the Podium Esports Network in just a little bit.